City Council meeting. Let the re record reflect that all City Council members and public officials are present. Let us stand for the, the invocation by uh, Reverend Bill Franks and then followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the light bearer named Christopher Columbus with courage forged forward into this world of the unknown. And we are thankful for the courage that you gave him to do that. We are thankful for the courage that formed and fought for this nation that we can live in the United States of America. We ask your blessing on this meeting here today for the men and women involved to be encouraged to forge forward for this city of Punta Gorda. May your wisdom guide all here today and may your peace be supreme as the business of this city is conducted. May the light of your love and the truth of your peace prevail in the lives of all involved. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll get started on our agenda this morning. Got to make sure I get up close to the mic so you can hear me and those who are watching can hear as well. We have five proclamations today, and the first one of these is the United, the United States Air Force Band Day, and uh, I get to the pleasure of reading that proclamation. So Proclamation City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas the United States Air Force Band is one of the most respected versatile and accomplished musical organizations and goodwill ambassadors in the world. Having had 12 international tours and covered 48 countries and 40 world capitals on five continents. And whereas the Singing Sergeants is the official chorus of the United States Air Force, presenting more than 200 performances annually. And whereas the United States Air Force Band and Singing Sergeants will be performing for the first time in Southwest Florida at the Charlotte Harbor Event and Conference Center on October 23rd and 24th, 2019. And whereas each band and chorus member is proud to represent all airmen whose selfless service and sacrifices ensure the freedom we enjoy as citizens of the United States of America. And now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim October 23, 2019, as U.S. Air Force Band Day throughout the City of Punta Gorda and urges all citizens to attend a performance by this outstanding organization, passed and duly adopted in regular session this 16th day of October 2019. Signed, Nancy Prafke, Mayor, and accepting is Frank Mazur. Military Officers Association of Charlotte Harbor and the Event Center. Thank you for this proclamation. We're both sponsors of this concert. Um, there are tickets, they're free tickets, uh, and there are a few available, although we expect a capacity crowd of the Event Center on both nights. I'm told both nights will be a different uh, arrangement. Uh, it won't be a repeat of the concert, so uh, if you can attend two nights, that would be great. And we're currently negotiating or working with the Navy Band coming here March 8th. I tell you, these service bands love coming to this community. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> and Council Member Wine is going to pr uh, provide the World Polio Day proclamation. Thank you. It's my honor and privilege. Proclamation, the city of Punta Gorda, Florida, whereas Rotary International, founded on February 23rd, 1905 in Chicago, Illinois, USA, is the world's first and one of the largest nonprofit service organizations with over 1.2 million members and over 35,000 clubs in 200 countries and the geographic areas. And whereas the Rotary motto, Service Above Self, inspires members to provide humanitarian service 
encourage high ethical standards, and promote goodwill and peace in the world. And whereas in 1985 launched Polio Plus and spearheaded the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which today includes the World Health Organization, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, UNICEF, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to immunize the children of the world against polio. And whereas polio cases have dropped by 99.9% .9 since 1988, and the world stands on the threshold of eradicating th the disease. And whereas Rotary has contributed more than $1.7 billion and countless volunteer hours to the protection of more than 2 billion children in 122 countries and is currently working to raise an additional $150 million, which if realized will be tripled by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And whereas these efforts are providing much needed operational support, medical personnel, laboratory equipment, and educational materials for health workers and parents, now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim October 21st, 2019, as World Polio Day. Passed and duly adopted in regular session the 16th day of October 2019, signed uh, with uh, Nancy Prafke, our mayor, and Karen Smith, our city clerk, and accepting as my friend James Williams. We are this close to eradicating polio in the world. There are only two countries in the world today that have active polio cases, and those are war-torn countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's very hard to get back in those mountains. And uh, Nigeria is just about on the, on the eradicated list. Uh, it has one more, one more year, and it will be declared polio-free. You have to be three years before you're declared polio-free. There were two cases reported in the Philippines about a month ago, and it turns out those two cases were from travelers who came from Pakistan. So we are so close, and uh, we are honored. The Rotary Club of Punta Gorda is honored to be a part of this effort to eradicate polio. We're having a celebration at our club on October 24th, and we have a few seats open. If anybody would like to join, come to our club, see what Rotary is all about. We would welcome you as guests. Thank you very much to the city and to the members of the population of Punta Gorda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next proclamation is the Florida City Government Week proclamation, and our city manager is going to provide this. Whereas city government is the government closest to most citizens and the one with the most daily direct daily impact upon its residents. And whereas municipal government provides services and programs that enhance the quality of life for residents making their city their home. And whereas city government is administered for and by its citizens and is dependent upon public commitment to and understanding of its many responsibilities. And whereas city government officials and employees share the responsibility to pass along the understanding of public services and their benefits. And whereas Florida City Government Week offers an important opportunity for elected officials and city staff to spread the word to all citizens that they can shape and influence this branch of government. And whereas the Florida League of Cities and its member cities have joined together to teach citizens about municipal government through a variety of activities, now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim the week of October 21 to 25, 2019, as Florida City Government Week, and encourages all citizens, city government officials, and employees to participate in events that recognize and celebrate Florida City Government Week. Passed and duly adopted in regular session the 16th day of October 2019, Nancy Prathke, Mayor. And accepting it will be Mikhail Finkel, our paralegal and assistant to the manager. Good morning. Uh, as the city manager stated, Florida um, City Government Week is an ongoing effort of Florida League of Cities. Uh, it's sponsored by the League of Cities to raise awareness about the services that municipalities provide, educate the public, 
and show residents how they can help shape and influence our community. Um, the city, at the city level, we offer the Punta Citizens Academy. It's an eight session, I say eight week, it's a partial day for eight weeks uh, held January through May. Um, and it's designed to give an in-depth look at city operations and service delivery. And through the presentations and facility tours, the participants will gain a better understanding of how the local government, along with the engaged citizenry, can improve the quality of life in Punta Gorda. So the next academy uh, will take, begin just after the first of the year. As I said, it runs January through May, uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays of each month. And you can visit the city's website to register or contact Hope Petkus uh, at the Public Works Department. Um, and also, uh, many of you already have that we have uh, the, um, my city. I'm part of it. I'm proud of it. Bumper stickers, uh, buttons to pass out through the community. You can get those through the city manager's office. Thank you. And our next proclamation is Crime Prevention Month and uh, Councilmember Cummings. Good morning. Whereas the vitality of our city depends on how safe we keep our homes, neighborhoods, and schools, workplaces, and communities, and whereas crime and fear of crime destroy our trust of each other and in civic institutions, threatening the community's health, prosperity, and quality of life, and whereas people of all ages must be aware of what they do to prevent themselves and their families, neighbors, and coworkers from being harmed by crime. And whereas the personal injury, financial loss, and community deterioration resulting from crime are intolerable and require investment from the whole community. And whereas crime prevention initiatives may include self-protection and security, but they must also go beyond these to promote collaborative efforts to make neighborhoods safer for all ages and develop positive opportunities for young people. And whereas effective crime prevention programs succeed because of partnerships with law enforcement, other government agencies, civic groups, schools, faith communities, businesses, and individuals, they now help to nurture communal responsibility and instill pride. Now therefore, the city of Council of City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim October 2019 as Crime Prevention Month and urge all citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, and businesses to invest in the power of prevention and to, pre to work together to make Punta Gorda a safer, stronger community. Passed until we adopted in regular session the 16th day of October, Nancy Prefke, Mayor. And this is um, Pam, our, our Chief Pam Davis. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Davis. on behalf of the department. He is going to training next week on crime prevention, so he'll be ready to come out and do target hardening for people and, and share his prevention tips. Well, we learned a new term, target hardening. <laughs> target hardening. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Duvall, as the chief said. I'm a lieutenant with our uh, community services section. Uh, crime prevention has been defined as an anticipation, recognition, and appraisal of a crime risk and the initiation of some action to remove it or reduce it. Here in the city of Punta Gorda, safety of our citizens and our visitors is paramount. Chief Davis and our staff are dedicated to providing the highest level of law enforcement service to ensure that we are successful in achieving this goal. Just as a reminder, crime mostly occurs with opportunity. Sometimes it just takes locking your car door to pre prevent you from being victimized. Thank you to our city council for recognizing crime prevention and the efforts that are made uh, to be successful in stopping crime. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and the, the final proclamation is the United States Air Force Thunderbird Days. And Vice Mayor Matthews is going to present this. The Thunderbirds are coming, yay! <laughs> This is my pleasure to give this proclamation. Whereas the Florida International Air Show is celebrating its 38th year, and whereas on May 25, 1953, the Air Force's official air demonstration team designated the 360th Air Demonstration Unit was activated at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. The unit adopted the name Thunderbirds, influenced in part by the strong Native American culture and folklore of the southwestern United States where Luke Air Force Base is located. From these humble beginnings and that first group of men, the Air Force Thunderbird legend was born. And whereas millions of people have witnessed the Thunderbirds demonstrations, and in turn, they have seen the pride, professionalism, and dedication of hundreds of thousands of airmen serving at home and abroad. Each year brings another opportunity for the team to represent those who deserve the most credit, the everyday hardworking airmen voluntarily serving America and defending freedom. 
And whereas the city of Punta Gorda is especially honored to welcome the premier aerial demonstration team, the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, to the 38th annual Florida International Air Show. And whereas the city recognizes the tremendous attraction and economic driver the air show represents for our community and desires to show its support of the United States military, now therefore the city council of the city of Punta Gorda, Florida does hereby proclaim November 1 and 2, 2019 USAF Thunderbird Days, passed and duly adopted this 16th day of October 2019, signed Nancy Prefke, Mayor, and accepting is the president of our very own air show, Dana Carr. Yes, the Thunderbirds are coming. We, we have a great show lined up. Civilian, everything for Patty Wagstaff, world champion aerobatic uh, demonstration. SOCOM, Redline are coming back. It'll be a great show. You've got to be there. This has taken five years to get the Thunderbirds back here. A lot of team effort, a lot of community effort. So we appreciate everyone, and we'll see you at the air show. Thank you. Awesome. We love it and can't wait to see them come. All right, the next thing on the agenda is uh, a presentation. It's the 2020 U.S. Census presentation. Mitchell? It's uh, <laughs> census time again. So here to present uh, what's going to be going on uh, around the country and in Punta Gorda <coughs> is Michelle Malsbury from the U.S. Census Bureau. And I'm um, just going to do a little... Uh, update for everybody on on the census thank you very much I have met with city manager and his staff and I think we have everybody completely on board but the 2020 census is especially important because it only occurs every 10 years it's called the decennial census and let me just click through some of these the first census was taken in 1790 it took them two years you might think with all of our technology it would take less time now but actually, we started preparing for the 2020 census back in 2013, and we'll really wrap it up in 2021. Okay, it equates to two different things. It's about political power. In 2010, Florida had such a good count overall that they acquired two new seats at the federal level, and it's about money. What happens with the census, depending on the count, is it sets the pace, as I mentioned, for funding for the entire next decade, whether it's infrastructure, um, health care, government, grants for any other institution, everything is dependent upon the count. Okay, These are some of the other ways that the census data is used, and in the packages I've given you, I have a sheet that has 50 ways the census data is used. However, there's over 2,500 different ways that the census data is used. <coughs> We exist solely as a statistical entity, and the only thing we do is compile statistics and help organizations decide if they want to come to your community. Uh, we work with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and determine demographics for different areas and funding, of course. And I know uh, very important for some of the communities in Florida, every, should be on everybody's radar screen, is for uh, forecasting FEMA funding. So the census count also is dependent upon that. Our motto is to count everybody once, only once, and in the right place. It's entirely confidential. It's private. We don't share our information with any other agency or entity, not the local police, not the State Department, nobody. Um, we will never go and ask for people's personal information, not on the decennial census. Now, the census does other censuses activities, I should say, not censuses, but um, the American survey and stuff like that during the off years where we're not conducting the decennial census. And in those, they're far more comprehensive and far more in depth. But the only time we would ever share any information that's collected on the census is once every 72 years, because that's what the forefathers deemed the lifespan of the average human being. Many of us are existing far past that now. Thank God, right? <laughs> OK, um, there will be a series of four postcards going out. And the first one will go out in mid-March. 
And the only way you can respond to that is, and I told you wrong, I'm sorry, city manager, but it keeps changing. <laughs> so um, we'll be either on the internet or on your telephone. And if you call in, there are 12 different languages available for you. And if you go on the computer, most of the libraries in the three counties I work, and I do Collier, Lee, and Charlotte County, and maybe now Henry a little too. But um, they're open, allowing people to go fill out their censuses if they don't have computers at home, that they can go with their library cards and do that there as well. Um, let me just address the other three while they're there. They'll go out the next few months after that. The third one that comes out of the postcards will actually have the census questionnaire attached. And did I send the questionnaire, the sample questionnaire to you yet? Okay, great. So if you have people who have language skills, any of the information I've provided you or the city manager can be translated into any other language you want. You can add your city logo, anything you want to do to help us get the word out about the census. And what I'm going to be asking all of you to do too is form what we call a complete count committee. And in that committee, we need to have a leader. I'm hoping city manager might be our highest one unless you decide you want to have someone else. But um, we need all of the people who are influential in your community to help get the word out so we can get the best possible count for city of Punta Gorda. Um, Charlotte County, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but it's in your packets too. I believe had 75 percent in 2000 and 75 percent in 2010 response rate. That's still 25 percent of the funding you're leaving on the table. And I have their maps in there as well. And I have data in there that I can send you that would be the low response areas. City of Punta Gorda might not particularly fall into that. The rest of Charlotte County may fall more prey to that, but nonetheless, we still want to make sure you get the best count you can get. Okay, we are also hiring and recruiting. I am told in the three counties that I do represent that we need 10,000 people, and those will be the people who will go and actually knock on doors when people don't respond. By the time the fourth postcard goes out, if nobody responds, then someone will go to their door and knock on the door and ask how many people live there and the 10 questions that are on the questionnaire. So um, do any of you have any questions for me? I believe that's close to the end of my presentation. Any questions, Howard? We, um, uh, we mentioned the uh, committee that uh, is being recommended to be set up. We do have a leg up. The committee members don't know it yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the uh, members of the 1% local sales tax committee represents all of the city neighborhoods and oh. as well as the administration as well as city council. So <laughs> our communications manager will be relaying that information to them. Thank you very much. Congrats. Welcome. We, we <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Council Member Kerry. <laughs> yes, thank you. <clears throat> okay, yes, sir. I uh, just want a quick question. In one of the slides, and I just want to be clear, it said that you would never ask for a full Social Security number. Right. Will you ask for a partial? Um, in some of the questionnaires, they do ask for the last four. Okay. I don't believe, and I don't know it by memory, I don't believe it's on this one, but it may be. Okay. But yes, they'll never ask for anything personal. And if perchance any of your citizenry are saying people are coming to their doors and saying census people are already there, because I've had people walk up to me and they said, I've already done the census. I said, you couldn't have already done the census. I'm sorry. You might have done another census, but not this one. And um, if we will all have badges, and if they're going up and asking personal information from people or knocking on doors this time of year, call the police. And, and tell them to do that as well because they're up to no good. Mm -hmm. okay. That's, uh, Gary's got a very good question. Um, with all the identity theft out there, I mean, yes. like, I'm not giving anybody even a partial on my Social Security unless it's absolutely mandatory. Right. Can, will they be able to pass by that question? I don't really know. I can find out for you. Um, it is 
mandated in the Constitution that people do participate. To our knowledge, I have never heard of anybody ever being prosecuted for it. So I would think that if you just, you know, don't write anything in that question, there will be no repercussions. <laughs> yeah, my concern is though it may not. The program may not let you proceed. Oh, if you're on the computer, it may or may not. I don't know. On the phone, when you call it in, you can probably tell the person, because it's a real person, I'm not going to do that. Hmm. OK. OK. And then, or you can certainly wait for the paper one. I'd like to have it. I think that would be great for us to have an answer on that so that okay. we can provide direction to people. OK. Um, that it, if you, for security purposes, <coughs> if you wish that this would be the way to go. Right. Rather than just kind of. Yeah. Try to figure it out. I mean, identity <laughs> theft is rampant. Oh, absolutely. I, am, I, I have been. I do not give my information out unless it's mandatory. No, I've been uh, <clears throat> identity theft fraud before, so I definitely feel your concerns. Yeah, and I will you. ask our office in Atlanta for clarification on that topic Thank you. for you. That would be great. Yeah, just so you understand, we all get put up weekly newsletters, and we can pass that information on appropriately sure. yeah. on how to get around it. So if, if okay. there is a way to okay. on the computer to not do that, and someone sure. chooses, we can uh, address that with okay. our constituents. Yeah. Yep. Yes, I'll check that out for you. And they, they believe me, they will ask. <laughs> and we I'm appreciate sure. that. We, we want sure. them to ask us. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. And we want them to feel safe and secure as well. So. Okay. okay. Anything Any else? more questions? Thank you very much. You're and welcome. congratulations to the committee members. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, city manager. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a great rest Thank of your you. Day. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. The next thing on the agenda, I see Debbie is over here just beaming with joy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next thing on the agenda is the introduction of board and committee member nominees. If you are nominated for a city board or committee, now is the time to come and introduce yourself so that we can know who you are and we can um, know, know your interest in participating. Hi, good morning. I'm Sean Harrigan, and I'm about to complete my first term as a member of the Bruns Store Isle Canal Advisory Committee, and I'm here today as a nominee for a second term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you for doing such a great job serving. I know you're the chair of the committee right now. My name is Charles Langenbarger. I live at 600. Madrid Boulevard and BSI, and I have also applied for the application for be on the advisory board. If you have any questions of me, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Carbologist, <laughs> former Chief Carbologist, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I've been involved in cannabis cleanup since uh, 2003. Thank you. My name is Rick Dahl. I applied for the position on the city, our canal advisory committee. I applied because I didn't think anybody else was. <laughs> and I would like to let you know that I'm a, I'm a snowbird. So I plan to fly down in the summertime for a couple of the meetings. But if you've got enough people running, I'll be happy to withdraw my name. Okay. Thank you, Rick. We appreciate you. your enthusiasm. Thanks. Are there any more? All right. Seeing no more, then we will proceed. We have. Uh, two public hearings, and we'll start off with the first public hearing. Yes, this is GA-06-19, the first reading of an ordinance. They'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda amending the City of Punta Gorda Firefighters Retirement System as adopted by Ordinance 879-87, and it's subsequently amended, is hereby further amended to provide for purchase of credited service for up to five years of prior firefighter service repealing all ordinances in conflict here, herewith, providing for severability and providing an effective date. Good morning. For the record, Mikhail Finkel, a paralegal assistant to the city manager. Uh, this ordinance was um, brought forth, recommended by our firefighter pension board. Um, the purpose is to allow uh, the members of that pension board can buy back service uh, up to five years for accredited um, military service. Uh, the requirement now is that uh, the repayment be done in a five-year period. They are wanting to extend that to a 15-year um, period, and I believe that is consistent with the collective bargaining 
uh, the current collective bargaining agreement that was just approved between the city and the uh, the union. So. Uh, any questions for Mikhail? Mm -hmm. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to uh, testify in this public hearing, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Good morning, Bill Albers, representing the Pension Board. Um, the Pension Board has approved this unanimously, and we look for your approval. If you have any questions that I can uh, answer, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Any questions for former Mayor Albers? Okay. Any, uh, this is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to um, provide comments, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Last call. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. There's been a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Make a motion to approve GA-06-19. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve GA-06-19. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next is uh, GA-07-19, which is the first reading of an ordinance that I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda amending the City of Punta Gorda Firefighters Retirement System as adopted by Ordinance 879-87 and as subsequently amended. It's hereby further amended to provide for expanded investment opportunities, repealing all ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for severability and providing an effective date. Mikhail Finkel, paralegal. Um, this again is a second ordinance recommended by the Firefighter Pension Board. Um, they have, uh, I will let Mr. Albert speak. There is a different way they would like to in invest their funds, um, and that does require an ordinance change um, from what was originally adopted. Okay. Specifically, uh, the Firefighter Pension Board members have a lot of uh, financial advisors. They get a lot of advice. And uh, their investment policy and what they are allowed to invest in, the ranges, are all adopted by ordinance. Um, so they have um, uh, gotten the uh, advice that they are looking at investing in a different type of investment vehicle that's currently not stated in the ordinance. That's why it's in front of you. It's still a fixed income. It's a uh, infrastructure and real estate assets and um, uh, it's done well in the past, and they would like to invest in that. So that's why it's in front of you. Uh, they do have ranges uh, that they can use, but uh, in this particular instance, we need to add this to their investment portfolio. As a list of what the, the po portfolio diversification can yes. be. Yes. That's, that's why it's there. Okay. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to comment, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Good morning again. Bill Albers representing the Fire Pension Board. At our June meeting, we decided to make a change in our investment after a discussion with our advisor to purchase <coughs> excuse me, an infrastructure fund, which has done very well in the past. And we made that decision only to learn from our pension board attorney that we couldn't do that without changing the ordinance because we didn't have a, a place for infrastructure or for real estate, for that matter, which we invested in several years ago. And it was unknown to us that we weren't supposed to do that. So we're fixing one thing and adding another. Um, and that's what requires the ordinance in front of you. But as long as I'm here, I, I want to just take a moment to tell you something else. A short while ago, we received our annual report from our actuary, um, which was the results from 209 municipalities for one-year investment returns. This is for 2018. Of the 209, the average return was 8.68. Of that 209, we were number 24. Our, our return was 11.08. Five-year investment returns, which is more significant, was 193 municipalities. The average return was 7.5. We were number 29 at 8.5. And the last thing I'd like to share with you is sponsor contributions, what you have to give. This is where the lower, no, the, lower the number, the better. 198 municipalities. The average contribution was 41.1%. We were number 54, 17.7. So I want to share that the news with you. We're doing pretty well. And I urge you to approve this. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, 
Answer them. Thank you for being such great stewards of our finance, financial portfolio. Um, anyone else wishing to comment? Please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Last call. This is public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. There's been a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? <coughs> motion carries unanimously. I'm going to make a motion to approve. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve GA-07-19. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, we will move on then into our quasi-judicial public or quasi? Yes. Oh. Well, you say quasi, I say quasi. Quasi, okay. No, quasi. 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 All right. So the next two items, V-03-19 and V-04-19, are both quasi-judicial public hearings. Anyone wishing to provide testimony or evidence in either of those public hearings will need to rise to be sworn by the city clerk at this time, please. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? I do. I do. When you're ready to speak, please come to the podium, state your name, and indicate that you've been sworn. V-03-19 is a request by Edward L. Watiski as authorized agent for <coughs> Thomas W. and Annette H. Robertson, property owners, pursuant to Chapter 26, Section 16.10, Punta Gorda Code, to allow a side yard setback of two feet at its closest point instead of six feet as is required per chapter 26, section 10.3H12. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna go to code. In order to construct an addition to the existing driveway for a single family residence located in a general single family zoning <coughs> district, um, the legal is Punta Gorda Isles, section 11, block 103, lot 25, also known as 338 Palm Isles Court, Punta Gorda. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official, and I have been sworn. I would like to enter the staff report in its entirety into the record by reference. This is a request to allow an expansion of the existing driveway with a right side yard setback of two feet instead of six feet as is required by the city code. And there are eight criteria that are required to be met prior to granting of a variance. And the first criteria regarding special conditions or circumstances, circumstances which exist which are particular to the size and characteristics of the land. For the records of the city of Punta Gorda, the house and the driveway were constructed in 2015 and a certificate of occupancy was issued in August of 2015. The subject property is located on a cul-de-sac as are other properties in the general single family zoning district. The configuration and layout of the house and garage make it difficult to expand the driveway and maintain the required six foot side yard setback. However, as this is a relatively new construction, a different configuration of the garage and driveway which met the required development standards could have been contemplated at the time of construction. Number two, the strict and literal enforcement of the zoning regulations would create an undue hardship. The strict and literal enforcement of the zoning regulations would not permit the expansion of the driveway within two feet of the property line. However, the house, the garage, and the driveway were constructed in 2015, and at that time, the configuration of the garage, driveway, and driveway could have been changed. Staff can find no evidence of hardship other than a mere inconvenience. Criteria number three, that such hardship is not shared generally by other properties in the same zoning district and in the same vicinity. There are numerous single family homes that um, exist on a cul-de-sac. Therefore, the hardship is potentially shared by other properties in the same zoning district and within the same vicinity. The granting of the variance would not be injurious to or incompatible with the contiguous uses in the surrounding neighborhood. The property to the east or the right side of the subject property has a driveway along their east right side of the property. Therefore, the proposed driveway expansion will not interfere with the neighboring property's driveway. That the variance requested is the minimum modification of the regulation at issue. 
Due to the current configuration of the garage, the expansion of the driveway within two feet of the right side property line is the minimum modification of the regulation at issue that will afford relief to the property owner. Criteria number six, the condition giving rise to the requested variance has not been created by any person presently having an interest in the property and or conditions cannot re be reasonably corrected or avoided by the applicant. The existing condition and configuration of the property itself was not created by any person presently having an interest in the property. However, the single family residential structure, garage and driveway were constructed in 2015 by the applicant. The garage and driveway configuration could have been changed at the time of construction. Therefore, the condition giving rise to the requested variance has been created by the applicant. Number seven, the variance requested does not involve a use which is prohibited. And driveways are permitted accessory use for a single family residence and the variance does not involve any use of the property which is prohibited. And the request is not in conflict with the City of Punta Gorda's Adopted Comprehensive Plan 2040. Additional findings. Staff at one point received one objection from the neighboring property owner at 336 Palm Isles Court, which has been rescinded via email. We did get an email from them that they have rescinded their objection. They received appropriate information from the applicant, so they are no longer objecting to the request. The building division had no objections to the request, and the public works department had no objection to the request, however, would like condition number one below added if the request is approved. The applicant, under conclusions, the application does not meet the literal criteria of hardship required for a variance, and staff can no, find no evidence of hardship for the request. If the request were to be approved by council, uh, these two conditions would like to be added. If the variance request is approved, proper permit applications must be submitted, including a line and grade permit application. And if any utilities, such as but not limited to cable, fiber optic, electric, water sewer, have to be relocated, it shall be at the sole expense of the property owner. And while staff understands the request to have the driveway configured with the existing garage, the application does not meet the literal criteria of hardship, therefore urban design staff is unable to recommend approval of the request. The Board of Zoning Appeals recommended approval of the request six to one with the above reference conditions. Any questions? Um, understanding that the neighbor has rescinded their objection, what was the nature of the objection, please? I think they were just, um, they were confused by what their objection was. They, they thought it was going to be encroaching upon their property. Okay. Any other questions for Lisa? This being a, I'm sorry. I have one question. The, does the, uh, the way the driveway is configured now provide, uh, uh, give any safety issues? Like can you drop a wheel actually off the cul-de-sac, another cul-de-sac or something? According to what the applicant has stated to us, that is one of the safety hazards is when it comes when they pull back out of the driveway, they do fall off the fall off the driveway and at the at the curb cut there. Okay. I have one more question. Lynn. Um, Lisa, what uh, is, are these two boxes the only things that would have to be relocated if they may not even have to be relocated. It, I know it's hard to see, but there's little white markers yeah, that are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's still two feet from the property line. The pink flag is the property line marker. The, things may not have to be relocated, but it is a requirement for them to get a, a permit or a requirement to get a line and grade prior to doing any work in the right-of-way. So those locates should be done at the time of that permit before any work is Mm -hmm. is done and they would let them know if anything needed to be moved. They may not need to be moved. Someone told me there was also a light pole at the end of the driveway. Is that something that they had installed? I'm not, I, I, I don't see it on this picture, no. but someone told me that they had driven by it and there was I also a light pole. I haven't seen a light pole okay. from any of the photos that have been provided. Okay. Debbie? I would, I would just like to say that as somebody who just has a, a brand new house going in next door to me, that is um, obeying the six foot limit, <laughs> that is not much space. However, when I drove by this and I saw where the pegs are, you can't really tell that 
that it's going to be two feet from their um, property line because it is green space uh, that the neighbor is up against. And I have a driveway like this where if I'm not really careful, I go off the <laughs> cul-de-sac. So for these, for this, I, I believe that we should grant the variance. It's a public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. And so we I can't have say to, that. We okay. have to allow for testimony to be provided. Okay, and then sorry. We will, uh, and our decision needs to be made based on the testimony provided okay. today. Okay. Not that we drove by it. Well, you well, can, you're, you're, you allowed can to you're allowed to, you're allowed to say that you did drive by it. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, but we need to allow for the testimony. Okay. We're not going to throw you in jail. What? Am I correct? Yes, to... very well. Okay. Um, any other questions of the city council? No. So this being a quasi-judicial public hearing, um, this would be the opportunity, Mr. Witiski, to provide any cross-examination questions you may have for staff. Um, and if you have none, you may um, make your presentation at this time. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, for the record, my name is Ed Witiski. I'm an attorney here in Punta Gorda. I represent Mr. Robertson, who uh, uh, is here today. Uh, uh, the, I don't have any questions, no cross-examination. Um, we're, uh, as was stated by Lisa, this is a uh, application for a variance of a driveway. Uh, our client uh, uh, is the owner of this property. Uh, it's a lot on a cul-de-sac, and I think you all have seen the lot, seen how it's configured, and uh, uh, can, can see exactly what, we're, uh, what our clients are, are trying to accomplish. Uh, when when the Robertson purchased this property in 2014, uh, Mr. Robertson uh, was concerned about the because of the narrowness of the road frontage of the lot was concerned about the uh, uh, how the how everything would mesh with respect to uh, the drive and uh, the garage, uh, and uh, was looking at doing some different types of designs, but based on a lot of different considerations, which Mr. Robertson will be able to expand upon a little bit better than I can, uh, it was determined to go ahead and build the home in accordance with the existing code, which required a six-foot setback for the driveway. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, the Robertsons moved into the home, and uh, uh, since it's been completed, uh, although they thought that they would be able to live within, you know, with the driveway the way it was without without a problem, it, it really has caused a problem, as Mr. Robertson can explain. Um, if, if I could, I'd like to go to the other podium. I have a few pictures that just illustrate this, I think, a little sure, bit please. more detail. Okay, this is, a, this is a, a depiction from the Charlotte County uh, GIS map of, the, uh, over, of an overhead of the lot showing the, uh, uh, showing the house, showing the uh, acute angle of the driveway coming out into the, from the garage. Uh, this, is, uh, this next photograph uh, is taken from the street. It, and you can see where the where the problem arises because the home had to be uh, sort of faced a little bit at an angle, and the driveway to meet the setback had to go at another kind of a more acute angle to, in order to meet the uh, provisions of the city code. Uh, this is a a, a close up a, more, a, a closer up view. Uh, the, the next the next picture, uh, if you can see, and it doesn't really come out that clear on the overhead, I think on the computer screens it might be a little bit clearer. The uh, uh, white stakes illustrate the proposed extension or expansion of the driveway uh, that, would, that would be constructed. We don't, it's gonna be within our, all within our client's property. Uh, we don't believe that it should affect the, uh, uh, the telephone uh, cable boxes or the other cable boxes that are shown in that picture, but if it does, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, our client has to get proper and appropriate permits in order to uh, do the uh, driveway expansion. Uh, the, the, the variance criteria, I'll leave that one up. The uh, variance criteria 
that uh, are in the city code uh, pro provide, there's a, the specific criteria, but the general criteria in the city code regarding the granting of a variance uh, states that the applicant shall be required to demonstrate that the granting of the variance will alleviate a clearly demonstrable hardship approaching confiscation as distinguished from a special privilege or, and this is the important or in the variance statement, or that the strict application of the ordinance would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict reasonable use of the property by reason of any one of the following. The very first one is exceptional narrowness, shallowness, size, or shape of a specific piece of property at the time of the enactment of the ordinance. And, and this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, narrow road frontage. There are other cul-de-sac lots, as, as Lisa mentioned, as we all know. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit, one of the more unique ones. And, and as I said before, uh, uh, when our clients constructed the home, they felt that the, uh, uh, they felt, yeah, it's going to be tough, but we might be able to make this work. But, but, but they have it. And that's really, the, that's really the issue, I think, that came up at the Board of Zoning Appeals. The, most, most of the discussion at the Board of Zoning Appeals uh, dealt with uh, whether uh, this was uh, a variance that was caused by the applicant himself. In other words, whether the, whether the variance was a self-created uh, or whether the hardship was self-created or the inconvenience was self-created. Uh, I, I brought up at the, uh, at, at the Board of Zoning Appeals that uh, the uh, self-created self hardship rules, there's a, there's a number of uh, uh, cases where a exception, where exceptions to the self-created hardship rule have been expressed by courts in certain factual situations. Now, of course, these variance cases are all very factually specific, but I do want to point this out to you because it does go to the criteria, and, uh, uh, in, in, and I believe it allows for a, uh, an approval of this variance in a manner that would be consistent with the uh, criteria that are set forth in the city code. The, the best statement of the inapplicability of the uh, self-created uh, hardship rule or self-inflicted hardship rule, as it's, as it's referred to, uh, is a, it's a legal treatise. I'm sure David will be familiar with it. It's uh, uh, Florida Real Estate Transactions, which is a pretty established uh, treatise concerning a lot of different areas of real estate law. And, and what that says there in connection with, the, uh, with this particular situation is, uh, that the self-inflicted hardship rule does not apply to situations in which the hardship arises from circumstances peculiar to the applicant's property, such as its unusual size and shape, and not from the conduct or self-originated expectations of any of its owners or buyers. And a, a, a case is cited. It's, uh, uh, it's a case that was uh, involved a variance application that was considered by the city of Coral Gables. And uh, the treatise goes on to say, in that case, city of Cape, uh, Coral Gables versus Greary, Geary, a variance was justified because the irregular shape and other peculiar physical characteristics of the parcel caused unique injury to the landowner and was therefore a classic hardship. Although, and this is what I thought found very important in, in this treatise and in the case. Although the plaintiff purchased the property with knowledge of the already imposed building restrictions, the self-created hardship rule did not bar the variance since the hardship arose from circumstances pe peculiar to the, to the realty alone. And again, our client did purchase the property knowing that it had narrow road frontage but felt that the utilization of the property would be uh, that, 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 that he and his wife would be able to utilize the property uh, with this existing configuration. As Mr. Robertson will, will explain, uh, it's, it's, not been, it's not been a situation where, uh, where they have been able to safely uh, utilize the, uh, the property. The, the other criteria that, the, you know, dealing with the, the hardship, self-grade, those are really the two. The other criteria are, pr are pretty much uh, clearly established. Uh, the the uh, 
Uh, granting of the variance clearly is not going to be uh, injurious or incompatible with contiguous uses. And I think that uh, uh, Mr. Robertson's, some of Mr. Robertson's neighbors are here. Uh, the the uh, neighbor that did object to the ver to the variance, uh, I think, was under uh, maybe I don't know if they were under misapprehension or not, but but regardless uh, uh, of that, uh, the uh, the the objection that they had was withdrawn after it was fully explained to them exactly what the nature of this variance was. I think it was kind of a, a little bit of misapprehension regarding the you know what what it would be what would be involved. Uh, the, the Board of Zoning Appeals had a pretty good, you know, we, we had a pretty good discussion and going back and forth with the Board of Zoning Appeals. The Board of Zoning Appeals uh, felt that in light of this, all the particular facts in this case, that the variance should be granted. Uh, and, and one of the, I think, important points that was noted by one of the members of the Board of Zoning Appeals was that this is not a situation where we're trying, where we're asking for a variance of a structure. We're not asking for a variance uh, of anything that would inhibit anyone's <coughs> view or, or really cause any, uh, any, any kind of a risk at all. In fact, this is kind of alleviates the risk because it's make, it makes it safer for uh, our, our clients to move and maneuver their vehicles in and out of the garage in this home. And uh, that was, I think, one of the uh, important considerations that was, that was expressed by the Board of Zoning Appeals when, uh, when, they cons when the Board of Zoning Appeals considered this matter and recommended uh, <coughs> that the variance be approved. Uh, I, 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 I like, Mr. Robertson is here. He's, uh, he's, he's got a back problem, but he, he managed to, <coughs> he, he, he did manage to make it here. This is obviously a very important uh, situation for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robertson that we would like your and, and request your help in, in dealing with. So I, I, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Robertson, he can answer some questions and let you know exactly what uh, some of the more specific concerns are with respect to this matter. Excellent. Mr. Robertson, would you please come to the podium, whichever, whichever way. Okay. You're fine. You can go over there. That's okay. I, I will do We don't this want you to hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we are empathetic. Okay. My name's Tom Robertson, and I've been sworn in. Um, I hear, I, and again, I, I, I don't know all of the, the legal terminology, but uh, the, the inference that there's no hardship here is, um, is just a matter of uh, experience in the situation. And whether we created it or not, when we, we knew there was an issue, and when we submitted our plans, we submitted our plans with the, the driveway uh, laid in a manner that I've, I'm um, pr uh, proposing it, it, with the variance. And, and of course, it was rejected because it didn't meet the criteria. And we moved things around, and we got it as close as we could. We did the very best we could. I had two architects look at it. And we thought it would be fine. And, and I've lived with it for four years. It, it's, not, it's not that it can't be done. But for some reason, as I've gotten older, it's gotten tougher. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't explain that. But uh, it is. And, and, and it's going to be a problem if it stays that way forever. I mean, it, it, it's not going to go away. And it seems uh, that, 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 that the proposal I'm making is, the, is a very viable solution, the only, uh, I think, reasonable solution. And, uh, and, and to do that, I, I need your help. And, and that's what I'm asking for, is, is your help to really enjoy. We, we love that house. We love that uh, lot. And we love Punta Quarter. And uh, I just want to be able to fully enjoy the, the, the property that we saved for and purchased. Other questions for Mr. Robinson? I have a question <laughs> instead of an opinion. Um, did you consider making that, that area any shallower, like any closer in? Like maybe it, it looks like it gets really wide there at the end. Gets wide. Yeah. Does, did you did you consider not going? Oh yes. All the way As a matter of fact, we probably considered uh, 
a hundred different layouts. To, to, to get the, this, what makes this lot uh, different is it because it's it's not symmetrical, and there's 180 feet of water, and although the lot is big, it's much bigger than 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 normal. The encroachment of the water makes the building area very complicated. All right, because I've got that 25 foot center right for that whole 180 feet across the back back there. And you say, well, why don't you turn the house the other way? It, see, the, how the lot's not symmetrical and it goes in on the right. If you try to put the garage on the, this side, then it, it won't fit. And it, it's, believe me, I, I, again, I, I had uh, two different architects try to do the best I could with it. And I'm not saying it couldn't have been done better. I'm saying we did the very best we could and we thought we could live with it. Yeah, my question is, it seems, I mean, I've seen many houses where the driveways are, the garages are turned and the houses are actually pie shaped themselves just so that they can, the, the garage door can focus directly at the, the cul-de-sac as opposed to tilting it. It looks to me like this was, the house was designed without regard to the, the property. And it the, the house points directly at the middle of the cul-de-sac. Well, it doesn't. The garage, the, the garage door does not point no, toward it, the... It's, it's over, but the, if, if, you take, if you go down the center, the entrance of the house points directly at the center of the cul-de-sac. Yes, yeah, so I, I guess my question was, why didn't the architect then turn the garage itself and adjust the, the design of the home so that, this, that the, the um, garage would be more properly that, that pointed toward the, the cul-de-sac? That was... That creates a tremendous financial issue. I understand. It is what the, the lot is, so... <laughs> Um, are there other questions for the, the owner? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to, to provide comments, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Please come to the podium and state you've been state your name and that you've been sworn. Mr. Witziski, as the member of the public is coming up, you'll have the opportunity to cross-examine if you desire any of the witnesses and you have an opportunity to do a, um, a rebuttal or follow-up summation. Okay, thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Paula Stankich. I'm a na neighbor of Tom and Annette's. I live on the street. Um, two things, just one is being a neighbor and the fact that I live in a community where generally the population is older. Um, there have been problems of people pulling in and out of the driveway there and going over his lawn and I just think that this would make it easier for everybody. I don't see a problem with it. I don't see where there's any impact on any of us neighbors to, mm -hmm. to the regard of him doing this. Okay. So I just wanted to go ahead and say that. And then also, as a realtor for 15 years, I don't also see any negatives here for um, anybody's properties being impacted. Um, I think it's definitely beneficial for him, but it's also beneficial for those of us that live there. Just wanted to put in my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. This is a quasi judicial public hearing. Anyone wishing to comment, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Um, does Mr. Butiski need to say uh, comments had, before he, we close the public hearing? Yes, he has that opportunity. Okay. Well, I, I don't, <laughs> thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't, I don't want to uh, prolong this. I think uh, 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 Mr. Robertson has uh, explained the situation. I hope we've explained the situation uh, that is being encountered here and, and our belief that the criteria uh, regarding the uh, granting of the variance uh, are and can, can be met here with respect to the s circumstances. And we just greatly appreciate your, uh, uh, your consideration of our request today. Thank you. Thank you. To, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say to aid in your consideration, the um, the criteria start on page two of staff's report. Uh, no, under, this uh, has not been closed yet. Under item K. So we need a motion to close the public hearing. M motion to close public hearing. Second. There's been a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. 
Motion carries unanimously. Now we can open for discussion. Gary? Uh, I'd just like to, to comment as a uh, person who did lose a house during Charlie and had to build a house from scratch, and a house that my wife and I absolutely adore and love. Uh, after living in it, there are a couple things we would have done differently if we had known to ask the question appropriately or to push mm -hmm. uh, in general. In this particular situation, a, uh, a variance is being asked to make the property uh, more amenable without objection of the neighbor. To me, that's the most important mm -hmm. part. And so I see no reason to allow this uh, property to not be corrected and uh, go forward with the variance as they ask. Other comments? Uh -huh. um, in, um, I, I, I feel that the case of Coral Gables and Geary um, gives support to this in a sense with two aspects. One, this particular case dealt with a triangular shape piece of property, which was just very hard to stay in. But secondly, it, it, it talked about um, that the, the, the self-created hardship would have been if the person were to, to have bought a smaller piece of the larger parcel. But in the case that this one large parcel was, was of an irregular shape that in this case, at least they say it wouldn't constitute self-harm. So I'm also in support of guaranteeing this. Mm -hmm. Are there other comments? Um, yeah, I had to ask the question that, you know, of, of the design, because it just seemed obvious to me that in, in planning for a home that you would think these things. But um, I also understand that the, the homeowner may have thought they could uh, – deal with the situation and now they find themselves in a predicament yeah. so there is another uh, another avenue they could take but w considering the gentleman's uh, back I don't think it'd be appropriate to ask him to buy a Jeep Wrangler with monster tires <laughs> either that or tear down the front of the house yeah. and reposition <laughs> the garage <laughs> okay um. Um, I'm going to th make a comment um, if you have any fact that these are um, intended to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. um, and I would call your attention to uh, criteria number two uh, as it relates to the undue hardship um, and would, would call your attention to the last sentence uh, in criteria two, uh, which provides uh, physical hardship, excuse me, physical handicaps or disability of the applicant and other considerations <clears throat> may be considered were relevant to the request. This is a relatively unique um, um, addition to the standard criteria uh, that I see in other jurisdictions um, and would simply point that out to you. Uh, it may not even have been discussed in the Coral Gables case because I don't think that was a part of that uh, that, that criteria, and you did you did hear testimony um, from the applicant, and and you saw the, um, his difficulty in in walking, and his, and his, like I said, in his test um, testimony. Mm -hmm. So that I'm uh, just pointing you pointing out that unlike some of the other variance requests that we've received, um, you uh, I wanted to let you know about that particular sentence in paragraph two. Thank you. Thank you. anyone wish to? I'll, I'll move that we uh, go forward with uh, approving for the variance. And are you going to approve it um, with the conditions of approval? Yes. I second that. There's been a motion in two seconds to approve V-03-19. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. I, and could I request, please, that Mr. Watitsky provide the clerk with copies of the photographs that he displayed? Can you do that? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Yes, and so the next item is V-04-19, a request by William Westvang as authorized agent for Clipper Cove at Bell Harbor, property owners, pursuant to Chapter 26, Section 16.10, Punta Gorda Code, to allow a side yard setback of 0, 0.0 feet at its closest point instead of 5 feet as is required per Chapter 26, Section 10.3H12, Punta Gorda Code, and to permit curb radii of 
30 feet and 32 feet instead of 20 feet as is required per Chapter 26, Section 9.4D, Punta Gorda Code, in order to construct an addition to the existing driveway for a multifamily condominium complex located in a general multifamily zoning district. The legal is common area for Clipper Cove at Bell Harbor, also known as 2000 Bell Harbor Boulevard, Punta Gorda, Florida. Good morning again, Lisa Hannon, zoning official, and I have been sworn. I'd like to enter the staff report in its entirety into the record by reference. As the city attorney stated, this is a request to allow an expansion of an existing ingress-egress driveway for Clipper Cove at Bell Harbor and Clipper Cove Village with a side yard setback of zero feet instead of five feet as, requ as is required by the Punta Gorda Code. Again, there are eight criteria that are required to be met prior to the granting of the variance. Criteria number one, the special conditions or circumstances which exist, which are particular to the size and characteristics of the land structure or buildings involved. This is a multifamily condominium complex which was developed in 1998 with Development Review DRC 21-98 approval, October 9th of 1998. The project was constructed in accordance with the approved site plans pursuant to the regulations that were in place at the time of construction. The subject property and driveway abuts the city's nature park on the <coughs> left or north side. The nature park was acquired, acquired by the city through a grant, which provides for specific permitted uses as well as prohibited actions. One such prohibition is to lease, sell, or provide any easement on the property for any purpose. This prohibition negates the possibility of the city providing an easement to the Clipper Cove at Bell Harbor Master Association for the driveway entrance. Number two, the strict and literal enforcement of the zoning regulations would create an undue hardship as distinguished from a mere inconvenience on the property owner. After reviewing documentation that was provided by the fire marshal, Staff finds that the strict and literal enforcement of the regulations would create an undue hardship as, re as it relates to public safety. The narrow width of the entrance and the roadway width appear to be inadequate for large emergency <coughs> vehicles. In addition, as residents and or contractors park their vehicles in the residential parking spots along or adjacent to the roadway, the vehicles encroach into the roadway, which serves as the main ingress egress to Clipper Cove and the only entrance to Clipper Cove Village. This, en this encroachment can severely limit emergency vehicle access, which in turn will affect public safety response time. Number three, that such hardship is not generally shared by other properties in the same zoning district and same vicinity. There are very few developments with a narrow entrance and a roadway driveway which abuts a city-owned park. Therefore, the hardship is not generally shared by other properties. Number four, the graining of the variance would not be injurious to or incompatible with the contiguous uses of the surrounding neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. Since the request to widen the entrance and ingress-egress roadway driveway will assist with emergency vehicle access and public safety response times, staff finds that the graining of the variance would not be injurious to or incompatible with the contiguous uses surrounding neighborhoods or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare that the variance requested is the minimum modification of regulation that will afford relief. The site is unique as this is the main entrance to Clipper Cove at Bell Harbor and the only entrance to Clipper Cove Village. Since the property abuts the, city's the city of Punta Gorda's Nature Park on the north side, the applicant and property is not eligible to request an occupation of easements due to the restrictions on the Nature Park property. The variance requested for a zero-foot side yard setback and 30 and 32-foot curb radii is the minimum modification of the regulations that issued that will afford relief to allow safer access for emergency vehicles. Number six, the condition giving rise to the requested variance has not been created by any person presently having an interest in the property and or the conditions cannot be reasonably corrected or avoided by the applicant. The existing condition and configuration of the property was not created by any person presently having an interest in the property. The project was constructed in accordance with the approved site plans pursuant to the regulations in place at the time of construction. Number seven, the variance requested does not involve any use which is prohibited in the district. 
and the property is zoned multi, general multifamily, 15 units per acre. It is a permitted use within the zoning district, and the variance does not involve any use which is prohibited. And the request is not in conflict with the City of Punta Gorda's adopted Comprehensive Plan 2040. Additional findings. When reviewing the original DRC submittals and staff reports from 1998, the driveway entrance challenges were called out to the engineer of record. And at the 1998 DRC meeting, staff that was in place at the time suggested that a variance may be needed for the driveway and entrance. However, staff found no record that a variance application was ever submitted. If the if the variance, um, I'm sorry, conclusions, the project was constructed in accordance with the approved site plans uh, pursuant to the regulations in place at time of construction. Vehicles which park in a residence driveway encroach into the road, creating an additional hazard. And the fire marshal has provided documentation of the inadequacy of the existing driveway width for entrance and roadway. If the um, variance is approved, staff recommends the following conditions, that appropriate permit applications, including but not limited to engineering, line and grade, building, et cetera, are required to be submitted prior to any construction, that no drainage can be directed onto the nature park property, and that the roadway should be clearly marked as a fire lane and no parking on the roadway at any time will be permitted. Based on the aforementioned approval criteria, findings, and conclusions, and due to public safety concerns regarding access and response time, Urban Design staff recommends approval of variant 04-19. The Board of Zoning Appeals recommended unanimous approval with the above stated conditions. <clears throat> Questions for Lisa? Um, just to offer the applicant the opportunity to cross-examine the um, city witness. Would the applicant like to come to the podium? This is a public hearing. Good morning. My name is Bill Westvang. Uh, I'm here representing Clipper Cove at uh, Fall Harbor. And you've been sworn. And I have been sworn in. I have. Thank you. Um, I thank Lisa for the very comprehensive description of uh, our issue that we're dealing with. Uh, it became, I'm also on the board at Clipper Cove, and it became apparent, apparent to uh, all the owners there that we had a real issue uh, that we needed to deal with uh, going back and trying to correct original construction situations that uh, uh, arose from the original construction. Um, I, I might add to the fact that not only is this an uh, entrance road to Clipper Cove, but at uh, Clipper Cove uh, Village as well, which there's 128 three-bedroom condominiums that use this road. So the traffic is quite heavy there. Um, not only is it a difficult situation for emergency vehicles, uh, but uh, delivery vehicles, just uh, residential vehicles, and it's a, an extreme hazard for anybody, that, any pedestrians that might walk in this area. Um, so the, we knew that we needed to try and uh, address it. We did hire Southwest Engineering and Design uh, to come up with a comprehensive plan to do the best we could to uh, correct the situation. Um, I did contact uh, Jennifer Molnar to get her opinion on it. Uh, she was completely on board with trying to do something to correct the situation because they deal with it quite a bit. I actually live right on that entrance road, and I see how many fire trucks get called in with the ambulances and so forth. There also is a gate in front of the entrance as you pass through Clipper Cove to get into Clipper Cove Village. So that gate sometimes does create an issue for us because uh, if people are not residents, and maybe they're visiting, they have to stop, get out of their car, go to the uh, pedestal to key in their codes or contact owners. And so what ends up happening is that 
cars will start stacking up at that gate. And because of the initial radius of the turn going down to, um, do you, can you put the map up there again? Well, it's a, it's a horseshoe of sorts, a U, and there's a back side of the, uh, up at the top. This road uh, right here. Yeah, get, I'll, I'll get it to it. There you go. This is coming in at Ball Harbor up top here. As you go down to here, that's the entrance to Clipper Cove. That's where the gate is. Cars stack up at that turn right there and people can't get to their units. Um, so that's why we wanted to increase or change the radius on that turn there so that people could get past. Also, vehicles that aren't able to enter into Clipper Cove Village have to try and turn around there. And they drive all over the landscaping, and so we might as well make it an area that's wide enough for them to be able to uh, get past there. <coughs> we also wanted to change the radius in this turn right here for people that came in here to go in on the main e entry road uh, just to make it more uh, drivable. Uh, it's, it's just real tight uh, to accommodate that many uh, units. Um, is there any questions that I can help answer? Comments? Questions? No. All right. Great. Your information has been Okay, clear. we do have Kevin Rainey here, who was the engineer that did all the specifications on the job. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions of uh, Kevin, he's Mr. here. Mr. Rainey has any additional information? Good morning, Kevin Rainey, Southwest Engineering and Design. Good morning. I have been sworn in, and I have a button. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, some of these pictures that you saw there, you could see that the edge of the pavement is being chewed up pretty bad, and that's a result of it being too narrow. Uh, the larger trucks keep getting pushed further and further over. They tear up the side of the pavement, and it, uh, yeah, right over here, mm -hmm. like this. And you can even see they hit the signs that get so close. Uh, so what we've designed is a hardened edge with a, a curb, uh, that goes right along the property line that will keep the pavement from disintegrating um, because it can't the tires can't roll over onto the um, ed, onto the ground so it'll be a vertical curb along there and then we're increasing the pavement about two feet and that's virtually the all, all that we could get in there with staying on our property so if you have any questions on the on the design or construction, I'd be glad to answer. Questions? Okay, this is a public okay. hearing. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to comment on you have uh, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. This is a public hearing. Please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Last call. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. There's been a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Discussion? Um, I have been in this complex a number of times, and, um, and in fact, years ago, I tried to help a friend purchase a condo unit down here, and we went in there. And one of the reasons why they didn't buy in there was because of this situation. And they didn't like that the gate was there, and it was a possible safety issue with first responders. So um, I totally sympathize, and I, I take um, um, this opportunity to thank you for being proactive as a board, Mr. Westbang, and I think that this is something that definitely needs to be done. I totally support it, and I would make a, um, a motion to approve V-04-19. Are you making that motion with the? With the stipulation that um, staff's, staff's recommendations Conditions of approval? Included. Yes. I second, second that. Okay, there's been a motion in two seconds to approve. V-04-19. Uh, All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. 
and we are glad that we are going to help make your community safer. Okay, we have an ordinance um, that is a second reading. Yes, uh, and um, before I um, open up this uh, uh, reading, we do have the opportunity for citizen comments on this item. So uh, if anyone has any uh, comments on GA-05-19, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Okay, I'm not seeing a big rush to the podium. No, so this is GA-05-19, which is um, second reading of an ordinance, which I read by title only. An ordinance of the city of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending chapter 25A, Punta Gorda Code, abandoned property and impounding of vehicles to establish local regulations for at-risk vessels and the relocation and removal of derelict vessels, prohibiting the storing, leaving, or abandoning of any derelict vessel, providing for enforcement, providing for conflict and severability, and providing an effective date. Council members? It's about time. Yeah. We, we, need, a we need a motion. I'll make well, a I motion. move. You make a motion? I'll, I'll make a move anyway. Okay. If, if Lynn moves, I'll second. Uh, I would make a motion to approve GA-05-19 with great pleasure. Um, there has been a motion and a second to approve GA-05-19. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously, and this is really um, a great step in the right direction to help us with this situation. And shout so. out to the police department for their proactiveness on this. Yes. Absolutely. What about our paralegal? Oh, our sure. paralegal? Yes, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Mikhail our paralegal. <laughs> Way to go, Mikhail. Now, we will be coming back before you with a resolution of, of procedures to um, effectuate the uh, okay. hearing process. Okay. Excellent. But I'm just so glad that we're, we're getting some teeth in this. So. Um, okay. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Anyone? Uh, we have citizens' comments on the consent agenda items, which will be approval of Minutes, we have legal invoices, and we have acceptance of a um, grant for the police department. Anyone wishing to comment, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Morning, Mayor, Council Members. Tom Cavanaugh representing Learn to Sail today. I would like to commend you on your decision to maintain and improve both the Bayfront Center and the Punta Gorda Boat Club as you consider lease negotiations with both of these entities. Are you talking about the consent agenda or are you talking about the regular agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I ahead of schedule here? Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. I mean, <laughs> We'd love to hear from you, Tom, but... You know. Never mind. <laughs> Anyone wishing to comment on consent agenda items? Okay, seeing none, uh, anyone wishing to pull a consent agenda items? Okay, then we'll see Once approval. again, thanks to the police department for another grant. And yes. I, I make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. This has been a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Yes, excellent to get another grant. Um, so now we'll start with the regular agenda. I have a request, um, and I know that we have an item here um, under seven under new business seven B, uh, which is the discussion regarding a request to establish a Deskin Lane, and I know that um, um, the applicant uh, or has asked if we can move this up because I know you ha don't you have a a luncheon you have to be at at, at eleven thirty. So would it be okay if we discuss this, this one first so that then the applicant can go ahead? Excellent, thank you. And we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, okay. I have to take, so, yeah, yeah, I have to take public comment correct. on this before we do anything. So, um, so if anyone has a public, anyone has comments on discussion item 7B, discussion regarding a request to establish a Deskin Lane. If anyone has comments on that, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. Do you want to, do, you want to take comments on all of the items at this time? No. Okay. I was just going to do this one item, just so we can move on with this, and sure, then we can no go problem. back and do the rest. All right. Because the applicant really needs to leave. So. Understood. Yeah. 
Okay. Seeing that we don't have any public comment, um, Mikhail, are you going to introduce this one then? Sure. Okay. Mikhail Excellent. Senko, uh, Paddle. Uh, so this this request came in as a um, street name change. Um, when staff started to review the request, went back, um, looked at the plat, as you can see, I've, I've shown it on the board. This was not de uh, dedicated as a public street, nor is it, it uh, an alleyway. Um, it's simply platted as an entrance to the playground, which is uh, what is now the former uh, Punta Gorda Library building, to the rear of that building. So, um, with learning that, we couldn't process this as a, a, a street name change. Um, it was be determined to be a, a public space, public area. Um, it is improved. Um, it doesn't have any markings. Um, and so, uh, as you can see on here, the uh, platted lots four and five, they are addressed as on Gray Street, 412, and I believe 421 Gray Street. However, both of their driveways are accessed by this um, unnamed, unnamed street, uh, roadway, we'll call it. So they use that to access their properties. So the request came in to, um, we would have to designate that or dedicate it as a street. Um, that is done by ordinance similar to what we did when we created Lashley Court over in front of the Crab House. Um, we would have to put up some stop signs, um, some minimal road marking. The area is only 50 foot in width. Um, our streets are typically a 60 foot right of way. So we would require some easements, easements from the property owners in order to install the stop signs. Um, I was informed by Public Works that the edge of the sign face has to be at least three feet off of the roadway. So it's not where the pole is, so it would require some easements to have those installed. Um, and then the second issue uh, that we ran into, the request, is to name this Desguin Lane in honor of um, the Desguin family in the community. Um, and we came upon a city council policy that was adopted in 2008 after... Uh, they named the Wally stage. Um, City Council established a policy not to um, name city property or streets for uh, honorariums or memorials. So those are the two issues we wanted to bring to Council to discuss. Um, one, staff direction to move forward on preparing an ordinance to dedicate the street. And second, um, how the Council would like to handle the, the established policy on naming. So that's what we're bringing to you as a, a discussion today mm -hmm. and direction. I have a question. Um, so um, before, I would like to um, state that the applicant came to me. I'm the person who put it on, asked to have it put on the agenda. And when the applicant came to me, it was not to specifically name a street. It was to make it a street because they um, have difficulty with people finding them. It, you know, if you do a... Uh, Google Maps, it doesn't show where they live. Um, you know, the delivery trucks have problems finding out how do I access the house. So th the problem was really trying to make it a street that, whatever it's called, uh, make it a street that people could find and to solve a problem that's been persistent. And, and then it was, well, if we're going to make it a street, what do you want to call it? And I wasn't aware of this, and staff didn't make any of us aware of this, um, and so I said, what do you want to call it? And in fact, I got asked, what do they want to call it? And it was Duskin Lane, and so I, they said, okay, well, we'll just submit it Duskin Lane, and then it was, I was surprised to find this in our agenda item. You know, I think had we known, perhaps we could have had a discussion as to what do we really want to call it, but um, I'll let Mr. Duskin Okay, thank you, Mayor. So uh, I just wanted to get a clarification in there on how it kind of transpired. And thank you for moving moving up, up on the agenda. I'm Frank Desgan. And uh, I think the letter that I wrote the mayor, I imagine you all have that. And it uh, pretty much generally explains the situation we're in. It is very confusing for people unfamiliar with the area to find either of those houses with Grace Street addresses when they actually face the platted entrance 
add, plat it as an entrance, but as I say in the letter, it's platted as an entrance, but it looks and acts like a street. And people use it all the time as a street. And not so much anymore since the library has moved, but there's still traffic on it. Obviously, we use it. And it is very confusing to people. And something that happened since I wrote that letter is I was out in the carport, and the FedEx truck pulls into the driveway. And I walk out to, he's got a package. He walks up to me and says, is this 413 West Gray Street? And I said, yes. And you could see the relief come off. And so if FedEx was having a trouble finding this place based on the address, then you can imagine <laughs> what average people have, uh, the problem they have. Uh, I was aware, uh, yeah, I've been working with Lisa on this for probably a couple of years, back and forth, and I was aware of the policy that was put in place years ago, and uh, that was the final response I got from staff that they felt because of the policy that there was nothing they could do that if I wanted to take it further that I would have to have it brought before city council for consideration. And I would just like to mention, point out a few things in the policy, and that is it's clearly references renaming city property. There is no name on this street. I'm not asking to rename anything, asking it to be named so we can get a good address so people can find the place a lot easier, including public safety folks. Also, there is a provision in there to, if you choose to, allow, you can make um, exceptions and, and name city property based on a person's or family's contribution to the city of Thunder Gorda's history. And if it's necessary, I'll be glad to give you a little background. <clears throat> and then the third thing is, if that occurs and the council's convinced that this, whatever it is, should be, have this name, then it allows for a 16 by 24 inch plaque. Well, I measured the McGregor Avenue street sign, and it's about uh, 324 square inches. Desgan is one letter less than McGregor, so it's gonna be smaller than that, and 16 by 24 is 384 square inches. So the street sign would be smaller than the 16 by 24 inch plaque. Also, the stop sign is, there is a stop sign there. So there, there is a stop sign, but of course there's no street sign. So um, I'll be glad to provide you any further information or answer any questions if you need, need it. Howard? Yeah, uh, in 2008, council established a policy. It's not an ordinance, it's not a resolution, it's a policy. So policies can be amended, changed, uh, you can be flexible with it, it's a policy. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Debbie? Mikhail, if I were to um, buy a, a large tract of property and I wanted to put streets in that property and I wanted to give them names, would I be um, forbidden from naming them after people that I think are significant to the history of Punta Gorda? I'll, I'll answer Based that. on this ordinance. Um, when you plant a subdivision and you're creating streets um, that ultimately will be either dedicated to the city or even kept private, you are indeed required to name the streets and you can name them any which way you choose. Uh -huh. yeah, I feel along that line of thinking because this is basically a new street that this is no issue, it doesn't even go against the policy. I think we're just naming a street a street. Granted, it's not a street, but we did name Buckley's Pass after. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. That's a wonderful individual. <laughs> yeah, we did. We absolutely did. I would also like to comment that Mr. Desquin has been um, the senior, I believe, has been inducted into the Punta Gorda History Center Hall of Honor mm -hmm. uh, several years ago. Yes. So um, as for his contributions to the, in the history of our community, as similarly as Jaha's grandmother is going to be inducted in um, December, on December the 7th. So um, just... And added. When I saw this on the agenda, my first question was, I couldn't believe there wasn't one already. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, if you will allow me, um, like Dizzy Dean always said, if it's the truth, that it's, it ain't bragging. So <laughs> let me, I, w I do want to go ahead and just give you a little background on my family and Punta Gorda. Um, my grandparents, uh, Louie and Gertie Desgan, arrived in 1936 
they had purchased the theater in town, which was where the Ace Hardware parking lot is today. That's where the building was. And they operated it for around 30 years. They were also, in the days of segregation, they were the first folks that brought movie theaters to the African com American community in Punta Gorda. And my granddad was also city mayor in 1944. Uh, my dad. <laughs> Tax collector's office for 30 years. Uh, I served as the county tax collector and thus as the city tax collector for 24 years. Uh, there was a 30 year period beginning in the 1950s where he coached just about every Punta Gorda boy that played football. Um, and as uh, Punta Gorda Chamber, as the chamber president in the late 1950s, he brought Little League Baseball to Punta Gorda. My mom, Peggy, uh, started the Youth Museum in 1969 that was located within the city of Punta Gorda for about 20 years. She was also instrumental in getting competitive swimming reinstated at Charlotte High School. So a lot of history, and I, I like to think that my family has contributed a lot to the city of Punta Gorda. So I appreciate your consideration. Lynn? Um, Mikhail, do we have any kind of a cost estimate of what it's going to cost to, to make this happen? I, I do not. I'd have to get that from engineering. It, it was basically two, I said, about $100. I'm sorry? $100. It's two stop bars. If he said there is an existing sign, we were planning on two stop signs, two stop bars. There no, no striping needs to be done or anything in the road, and maybe a narrow road sign. That, very minimal. Yeah, just to clarify, there, there's a stop sign at Gray Street. There is no stop sign the on, the, on the alley side. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Gary? I just want to say, you had my vote until I found out your father was the tax collector. <laughs> 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 but, but you got it back when you brought the sports back in. <laughs> and just uh, a clarification, um, both of the residents that would have their addresses changed are in favor of you know, of this, so there's no objection okay. from staff or from, yes. Okay, so I move that we uh, uh, go along with uh, the request. A second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the request to establish Deskin Lane. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you all very much, and please remember it's a G. Not a Q. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think my, that my mom always said she always thought it was a Q till she married Dad. So <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, this need will to follow be. up with an ordinance, but okay. at least City Council is approving us to move forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will go to the regular agenda. Um, should we? Yes. Should we? Yes. Take a break? Yes, okay. Uh, I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 1042. Let's come back at, at uh, 1050. Thank you. That issue um, uh, um, I was um, I was concentrating on something. On that meeting we were gonna have. Oh yeah, no worries. Yeah, it was a that Monday got crazy, and that just completely slipped my mind. I figured uh, you're in the news business. It wasn't breaking. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, you know, just I try to make sure if I made your meeting to keep the, the darn thing. So, you know. so you still need.
Please turn the air conditioning down. I am, my teeth are ch chattering. Okay. I mean, I'm frozen. That's the way I feel, though. I feel like I have a bit. It's the restroom chatter as well. I walked yeah, in from I that building. Yeah, it's like a wall of it's air for the, for the, for the next air. meeting. But lastly, it's going to make sure that it's And then if I need anything else from you, I'll be in touch. Thank you. I don't see why we couldn't have just soldiered through this. Meeting. I said I don't see why we could have just why we couldn't have just soldiered through this meeting. Why do we have to take a break? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because some of us. <laughs> Thank you. Council is now back in session. Hello. Thank you for all of your enthusiasm. I'm glad to see everybody talking, and you know it's great to see the community is really engaged. So uh, we will start our regular agenda. Well, we'll continue the regular agenda, but now we will take citizens' comments on all regular agenda items, with the exception of the desk and lane item. That would be the award of, please? Oh, she's saying that's you, Tom. Yeah, now it's time for Tom. It's the award of the authorization to CPH uh, for the Cooper Street Multi-Use Recreational Trail. Input on the Plan Punta Gorda 2019 Citywide Master Plan. A discussion regarding the US 41 uh, Airport to Carmelita Improvements Project. A discussion, uh, no, and we'll include the performance objectives, departmental performance objectives in that as well. So, Mr. Cavanaugh. Morning. Still Tom Cavanaugh representing Learn to Sail. <laughs> and it's still morning. And, uh, our attorney reminded me that I only have two minutes and 30 seconds left. <laughs> I'll start the three so, minutes over. <laughs> so, first, I would like to commend the, the uh, council for your decision on to maintain and improve both the Bayfront Center and the Punta Gorda, Punta Gorda Boat Club. As you consider lease negotiations with both of these entities, we respectfully request that you consider the sailing center. We have leased space from the Weiss and City Council approved it back in 2014, I think that was the original lease negotiation. And as you consider implementing the Dover Coal Plan relative to the Bayfront Building, we would like you to know that we are in complete agreement with their recommendations with regard to sailing and look forward to working with the city to accomplish those objectives and goals. At the same time, we would like to thank the city, particularly Public Works, for working with us on many of the housekeeping projects that have taken place there in the past. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge the terrific relationship that we have with the Punta Gorda Boat Club. They have made their docking facilities available to us as we launch our sailboats and our safety boats. And we'd like to thank MAC for their support over the years for uh, funding our safety boats and other improvements that we have made over the years. I'd also, I'd like to introduce Julie Jackson, who is the president of Learn to Sail and chief energizer buddy. I wish that was true. Um, just to add on to what, uh, what Tom has said, um, on behalf of all the volunteers uh, at Learn to Sail, we want to thank you as a body 
for working towards renovating Bayfront uh, and the Boat Club. Um, we use that facility hard, and I know, and our, our, our members here uh, that will tell you, we've touched a lot of kids' lives by teaching them how to sail. Um, and all of our volunteers that learned to sail want, to, want you to know that we're very humbled and fortunate to be part of such an amazing community that's willing to support uh, and revitalize the waterfront in Punta Gorda. Uh, we look forward to this renovation, and we really hope that you will call upon us if there's anything that we can do uh, to help you help us. So we are not wanting to just sit by and let you do it. We are willing to, to get our hands dirty and do whatever we can. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Wendy Mueller. Um, I want to, I'm delighted by the decision made by our city council to have an outside appraiser evaluate the activity center at 750 West Red Esplanade. As you know, I've had the privilege of engaging many of our local business partners in Punta Gorda to accurately examine the plausibility of remodeling. The rich history of events held in the building, weddings, engagements, family reunions, and of course the Boy Scouts beginning in 1957, as noted on the front wrought iron, certainly seemed worth trying to hold on to. Each one of these contractors has spent time and personnel to come up with the most accurate estimates, meaning that if the new appraisal comes in at an anticipated original value of $660,000 and the total renovation dollars are under $330,000, we could start the renovations tomorrow and actually stay within our budget. Having said that, I went to work to find out. <coughs> I have something we could put on an overhead if we can put it on the over there. Yes. Sorry. Should have told you. That's okay. <coughs> These are the different companies that took their time and took me seriously mm -hmm. to give me estimates on what it would cost to put new windows in, to put new kitchens in. You want to say something? To put a, Excuse a plant. Excuse me, pardon me. Howard wants to, would like to Oops. say so something. If, if, if when city council gets to the point where uh, we put a budget together and actually allocate dollars to renovate the Bayfront Center, we will be uh, going out and going out to bid for these services. So please do not, please take that down because you mentioned some companies' names and they may actually bid the work. That, that's true. This was an experiment by the city, by myself, mm -hmm. as an individual, to try and find out, is it feasible? Can it be done? Because if it can't be done, by the time things get done, they'll be out of budget, and once again, we'll have a number we started with and triple that number in the long run. So to get an appraisal on the building and, a, and an idea of the renovation dollars is what I set out to do. The end result is, after doing painting, plumbing, roofing, flooring, kitchens, windows, and even the wrought iron for the Boy Scout 1957 um, pole, we landed up at well under 330000 In fact, after the infrastructure is done, there should be enough money to put the pergolas up and make the outside pretty, too. I just want to let you know it is feasible. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just would like to comment that, um, you know, we will see what staff um, recommends in, in the final design of the whole thing. I appreciate your efforts and, and, and your, um, uh, what you're trying to, the message you're trying to deliver, and we'll see where this goes. Uh, we may end up, um, you know, then applying for historic status and to be able to do whatever we need to do. So we've got lots of options. So. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input, input on the uh, master plan. Um, a long time ago, someplace far, far away, uh, we moved somewhere where the community had just hired a new city manager. And I was, um, I was at his presentation where he was introducing himself to the community. And he said something that obviously resonated with me because I, remember, I remembered it ever since. 
he said that when he went into a new community, a community, he assessed um, its current vitality by looking at its library, and he assessed its past and future vitality by looking at its management and preservation of its green spaces. And um, I just have always remembered that, and I, it, when I saw Dover Cole and what they had to say about preserving green spaces, it was um, something that reminded me of that, and I, I, I am very glad to hear that they uh, came out with that, and I hope that the city council follows through and, and um, looks to the future vitality of this community. As a community grows, its need for green spaces grows as well, which really argues very strongly for their preservation, because as you know, the green spaces can shrink as the community grows. But we need to consider that they're going to be needed even more in the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Bob Fritz, Bernstein Lyles on the master plan. I'm gonna read an email I sent to uh, mayor and council. While the proposed master plan by Dover Cole contains a lot of pertinent information, there are, in my opinion, some glaring deficiencies which should be addressed before council either accepts or adopts the plan. The decision to update the master plan was driven by two items, the building heights in the downtown area, the discrepancy between the property tax ratio of residential to commercial, which currently is 89% to 11%. While the plan does increase the building height to 75 feet above flood elevation, it does so with a massive increase in residential density. 15 units per acre go to 50 units per acre. As a comparison, the density of the single family homes in PGI and BSI are five units per acre. Dover Cole proposes that this high density will consist of apartments. In fact, the plan proposes that over 600 new apartments will be constructed on the marketplace property, the USAID property, and the Fisherman's Village property alone. The plan then proposes residential, apartments or condos, construction on what seems like every square foot of vacant land in the city. What the plan also does is propose the demolition of an existing commercial rateable, the PG Waterfront Hotel, and the construction of new residential buildings on its site. What do you think the effect of all this residential construction will be on the commercial property ratio? I think that was left over, I think. Okay. Uh, let me find myself on the commercial property tax ratio, especially since Dover Coal really does not propose commercial construction anywhere in the city. They do pay lip service to it by mentioning maybe some retail below the new apartments, but there is no area of the city that they're proposed to be a commercial zone. I would think that the Jones Loop area would be perfect for commercial de development, but Dover Coal proposes residential over virtually the whole area and also proposes a farm. Where would a Costco, a Trader Joe's, or other big box retailer build in the city? Where would light industrial uses be located in the city? Punta Gorda is located midway between Sarasota and Naples. Cheney Brothers recognize the value of the location and in fact in expanding their distribution facility. I am sure that there are other firms out there who would think the same way, but the master plan has no provision for this type of use. I believe that this is a huge omission. I guess Cheney Brothers is lucky that they are located in unincorporated Charlotte County. They would apparently not be welcomed in Punta Gorda. People talk of housing for millennials in the city. Let's be realistic. If there are no good paying jobs, the millennials are going to live elsewhere. Without large distribution uses like Cheney Brothers, without light industrial employers, without technical facilities and office parks, we will always be a retirement community. This is not necessarily a bad thing, but I would think that it would be very hypocritical for the city council and or staff to ever again complain about the residential to commercial property tax ratio if this master plan is adopted in its present form. Residential everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there other comments? Good morning. Gary Skellicorn. I didn't think you could uh, be there without uh, me to make a statement. Actually, this is a little, a little bit on the... I'm foul on of the gentleman previously. I want to give a little history to lesson on uh, the master plan. It was about a year ago, 
that uh, we were looking at uh, what we might do that drove the master plan. And I'll tell you what it was not at that time. It was not to uh, uh, review one-way streets, crosswalks at the Wayburn. Are you intending for your comments to be on the uh, overhead? No, I don't have any comments such as that. <laughs> They're up on the overhead. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess you saw my scribbles, too. Okay, well, let me, let me try without that. I didn't that, think you were probably intending them for them to be part of the public record. <laughs> Thank you. Slowing of 41, and, uh, neighborhood centers, bridge lighting, roundabouts, waterfront activity center, these were none of, the, none of the things that drove our desire for a master plan. And I think it was Team Punagorda that said, hey, we had a master plan years ago. Let's bring it back up again. But what was really the driver at that time, what I perceived, my own view, it was a fast track of LDRs, the land development regulations, focused largely on height. And I think we have to maybe refocus on that coming into the implementation. Your paper is hitting the microphone, <laughs> and so it's just creating noise for the microphone. Okay. How about that? Did that do? No, no. Your paper. So you're you're holding your paper there. against the microphone that's right oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. And so you're not creating... hearing me. Do I get to start over again? No, no. <laughs> we can hear you, but it was creating problems with the microphone. So the people that are listening watching us live All right. might be hearing a lot of interference. So Well, they got to read I'll, what I wrote. I'll just give you no, a they got to hear time. What, I, yes. what I said. <laughs> Anyways, I think I can cut it short at that. Again, we ought to be focusing back on what the original purpose of the master plan was, and that was to establish <laughs> land development regulations that uh, were in line with the population, with the residents of the city. And again, 84 feet sticks in my mind. I don't know if it sticks in anybody else's mind. With that, I thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments? I make a comment. <laughs> no. Who's the gentleman that's going to speak? Uh, good morning, Jerry Fallon, uh, PGI. Uh, I live in a community that Dover Cole uh, put a plan in place, um, and I thought it'd be best if I come and share some experience that I see that I've seen over the past 25 years. I've watched it evolve. Uh, some of the good things and some of the bad things. Um, what the community did first was they got the infrastructure right first. Pedestrian, bicycle, getting rid of the one-way pairs, slowing speeds downtown. I would certainly urge you to adopt the portion of the plan that that breaks in the, the neighborhoods down into um, zones. I forget the technical name of it but slow speeds down the central core <coughs> and, and speed them up as you, as you get into the more rural areas. Um, they got the infrastructure right first, made it uh, accessible for people to fill in downtown. Um, I like the idea of neighborhood centers uh, throughout town as well as um, uh, the density. Back then, they didn't roll in the density along with the, uh, with the plan, and I think that's a smart approach. Um, the way they did that. <clears throat> what they didn't uh, accomplish or didn't foresee back then was the changing um, retail uh, revenue stream um, and what they have done since then. They said uh, neighborhood, uh, the, the national uh, retail is, is going up three, four percent. Uh, they saw their community only attracting uh, getting 1% in retail, and that's because a lot of the downtown space was gone to residential. What they did is they enacted a, uh, a policy where uh, anything on the ground floor cannot be residential. Uh, this will certainly preserve uh, a retail space so we can generate more of a, uh, a retail base. Um, another thing that they, they didn't do uh, properly, but they didn't really foresee it coming because things change over 25 years, but building in a, uh, a review process every uh, two, three, five years, whatever, a hard review process would be smart. Um, they forever tinker with it. Another option that you might consider, and this is getting down the road probably 15 years, unfortunately, I wish I was around in the next 25 years to see this whole thing evolve because their work speaks for themselves and it's gonna be a beautiful thing. Um, 
in Fort Collins, for instance, they expanded their downtown, downtown core area. Uh, and along the main corridors, they went ahead and uh, said, you can go ahead and go up to 75 feet, five stories. That might be an option that we could consider here, whether it be along the 41s and Taylor. Um, uh, that's something that could be uh, worked into the process, but that's years down the road. Another uh, element in the plan that I really liked was uh, turning um, North Taylor into a pedestrian way, uh, mostly a pedestrian way. That's just genius. It truly is. I mean, that's going to create um, the property values surrounding that area is just going to explode. It's going to be much more attractive to a developer who wants to do the, um, the city center area and... Uh, Create the, create the core, uh, core area that we and the civic space that we, that we really need to to uh, to um, build off of. Um, if there's anything else, I think I'll pass that along. But thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Council Larry Yeager. Um, I want to talk about the master plan. The master plan addresses the goal to create meaningful places in a thriving community. I commend you on your decision to seek out a firm like Dover Coal to walk us through the process. Dover Coal has done their part by creating a wonderful master plan. I particularly like their input on green spaces, walking, and biking. In our car-centric world, I understand that not everyone will embrace these suggestions, but we all know how the prolifer prol proliferation of cars, roads, and parking lots can degrade the community. Dover Coal has done their part. It's now up to our community to embrace the recommendations and actually implement the guidance in the master plan. I hope that we as a community, and specifically you as our council, have the wisdom and courage to make that happen. Thank you. If anyone else wishes to speak, please line up behind this young lady at the podium. Thank you. I'm Janet Watermeyer. I'm with the Visual Arts Center as its executive director, but I'm not here today to talk to you from that perspective, but from a long-term Panagorda resident and a long-term Panagorda watcher. Um, I have always been impressed with how City Council and this community thinks about the future. Um, many of you may not know my background and my career was in economic development economic development in Southwest Florida, at the state level, and throughout many of the communities in the state of Florida. And what you are doing is truly visionary. And so now you're into the devil in the details. This is when everybody comes out of the woodwork and has an opinion. But at the end of the day, and, and, and even today, it's very hard to get two people in a room to agree on anything. But what you have done by hiring one of the best in the country to be able to take a look at the future, the courage that you're showing by allowing everyone to have their input. I have never been to a planning session that attracted 750 people, and I have been to a lot of planning sessions in my life. And I have gone to all of the input sessions, and they're standing room only. So right now is a very difficult time because the devil is in the details. I just wanted to come and from an economic development perspective, someone who's been here a long year, a long time, and really cares about the future of the economy, those um, cities that have taken and done what you have done are those that thrive. Those that haven't have haphazard development and unintentional consequences. So I'm applauding you and I'm encouraging you not only to approve this, go forward with what Dover Coal has put together, it's a very good plan, but also to take the next step and get the land development codes written so that we can have the future that Punta Gorda deserves. I thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I I think we can move on. One more. You well, can. <laughs> uh, Adam Cummings. I'm just representing myself. I wanted to talk about the city's master plan. I um, one of the and and over in general, I'm supportive of it. Grateful that you're doing it. It's good things. It's something that should always be an ongoing thing. I think that uh, it's. Uh, evidence on evident on its face that anyone that has really paid close attention to our future land use map and our growing community that uh, um, we're not on a sustainable path right now. And in fact, I think that's part of the 
broader conversation that I don't hear happening in the community. I graduated in the top 10 of my class. There was six of us, okay? Punta Gorda is a big town. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I like it just the way it is. And I think there's a lot of people that think that if we do nothing, it's going to stay just the way it is, as wonderful as it is. You all have done a great job. Tragically, it's not going to stay just the way it is. We're a part of Southwest Florida. Charlotte County ran a build-out scenario, said, what happens if we do nothing with the development that's already approved now? In little Charlotte County, including Punta Gorda, you, have a, you would have a population larger than the current population of Tampa. Over half a million people in little Charlotte County. Doing nothing causes $14 billion just in transportation costs and impacts in 1997 dollars. Doing nothing is not as sustainable. We have insufficient infrastructure, insufficient commercial, insufficient industrial, insufficient green space, insufficient schools, insufficient everything. It was laid out as an inventory of lots to sell. And not making those changes earlier on is not only going to cause our quality of life degrade, it is the singularly most expensive option that we can take. Making the community more pedestrian friendly, um, providing more commercial nodes, more closely located to homes, having that density located for residential density located closer to those homes cuts that figure by more than half, from 14 billion down to uh, by eight billion down to six billion. Um, so you're moving in a positive direction. I think that there's still some improvements that we can make, but know that uh, we need to make sure that we don't think that doing nothing keeps things the way they are. It's the most expensive and lowest quality of life option we have. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Okay. We can move forward. Um, yeah, we didn't have th that many comments about the, the Citizens Master Plan at the last meeting. So when Howard and I talked about should we move and help keep that as a separate item, we said no, there weren't that many comments. And, and actually all of our comments today were re related to it. So it's, we thank the, our community for the interest. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the budget. Award of specific authorization to CPH. Howard. Good morning, Ann Heinen for Kierman, for the record. Previously on August 21st, 2019, City Council awarded a master agreement to CPH Inc. for engineering services to design multi-use recreational trails in the city. Uh, staff requested a specific authorization uh, procurement received that request uh, for CPH to design a multi-use recreational trail on Cooper Street. Um, the cost of the design services, including permitting and bidding services, is $387,721. And that's a not to exceed contract, which includes subconsultant and reimbursable <coughs> uh, budget. Staff is requesting an additional estimated $20,000 for permitting fees that will be mainly used for railroading, railroad permitting, uh, for a total cost of $407,721. Completion is estimated within 284 days of the notice to proceed. Staff is recommending the award of specific authorization to CPH Inc. of Fort Myers, Florida. Howard? Uh, this design and eventual construction, along with the airport road MERT, multi-use recreational trail, completes the original loop, the original Punta Gorda Pathways loop that was uh, conceived back in 2006, seven timeframe and eight. Um, and it took a long time for us to get to this point. Uh, the issue here is, um, the 1% sales tax committee uh, 
is going to be presented, if they have not already, with uh, both Airport and Cooper Street. The original projected budget back in 2013 was well under what the projected costs are now, almost six years later. We know why. Uh, costs have gone up, plus we have two railroad crossings to go over by the CVS and Publix on Airport Road and at Cooper and Mary Street. The railroad is re going to require significant construction costs to deal with the railroad crossings. It's still a very important project. If we believe in the Punta Gorda Pathways, especially the original way it was conceived, this is the last piece of it, the last loop, Airport Road and Cooper Street. And it goes through a significant population base. And it takes you from uh, 41 at uh, Airport Road all the way to the entranceway to the Punta Gorda Pathways across the street from the hospital. Comments? Or I questions? Move, I move approval of specific authorization number two to CPH Incorporated. Second. There's been a Motion and a second to award the specific authorization number two to CPH. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Yes. It's a great project, and I'm really looking forward to the day when we can have this entire loop completed. Okay, we'll move on to then um, the unfinished business the public input on the plan, Punta Gorda, we've already had a lot of public input. Is there a discussion on this at this point? Howard? So everybody is aware, um, I discussed it with the one-on-one. -on, -one. on November 6th, we will have in front of you a resolution, uh, whether to accept the citizens, the no, citizens, the plan Punta Gorda master plan. I keep calling it a citizen's master plan myself. No, it's it's, it's like it ingrained is, in my brain. <laughs> it's the citywide master plan. So in front of you on November 6th will be a resolution as to whether or not to accept the plan. Uh, depending on what you do with that, there will be another agenda item uh, also on the agenda for you to consider having staff move forward with uh, negotiating a contract amendment for the land development regulations and the uh, uh, amendments to the comprehensive plan. So everybody's on board that that's going to show up at the next uh, council meeting on November 6th. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Sure. Gary. I would like to make a comment to my good friend Gary Skillcorn. I was the one that mentioned 84 feet. It was a way of getting moving the conversation forward to us and I can't believe we still have it but I will say it made I didn't make a new friend out of out of my controversial comment about 84 feet so <laughs> we're we're still bickering about this but we're also very very much on board on many other issues <laughs> there you go are there any other comments okay then we'll move on to new business a discussion regarding the US 41 airport to Carmelita improvements project for the record, Mitchell Austin, Urban Design. Um, several years ago, the city submitted, almost a decade ago now, uh, the city submitted many projects for consideration on the, uh, the MPO's uh, project priority list, and those projects remained unfunded for many years. Um, many of them were complete streets projects, including things that were our, on our Punta Gorda Pathway system. Uh, this one project, US 41 Airport to Carmelita Street, um, was also included in that list, and uh, it has been uh, funded. And the city is, um, the FDOT is looking for the city to enter into a local agency program or LAP agreement uh, with them for the design engineering of this project. Uh, the project is along US 41. It is from Airport Road to Carmelita Street, as approximate as just under 0.6 miles. Um, the uh, project program is to include pedestrian enhancements, ADA compliance, crosswalks, intersection treatments, and uh, enhanced lighting. Uh, 
Currently, in this fiscal year, uh, FDOT has programmed $151,000. Um, in discussions with FDOT staff, this project has been listed as roadway resurfacing. Um, so we're in discussions with them to see what exactly they want this project to be scoped as. Um, based on those conversations, we anticipate the engineering costs to be significantly higher than what we had initially anticipated. Um, so we're requesting uh, 500, 000, up to $500,000 for that engineering phase. Construction and okay. construction engineering inspection services are funded in the current uh, five-year transportation improvement program for FDOT in fiscal year 2021-2022. <coughs> um, FDOT does fund uh, their, their fiscal year from July 1st through June 30th, so it's actually so it begins in July. Um, the engineering funding and our discussion with, uh, with FDOT staff, there may be the, the possibility that based on the scope they will increase those funds. There are no guarantees, but there is that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so what city staff is, is requesting in terms of a recommended action is to appropriate $1,000 from grant revenue to the general construction fund and $349,000 from either the one cent sales tax funding or transfer from the special use fund to the general construction fund so that we can proceed with um, scoping and, uh, and procuring engineering design services for this project. And, and the appropriation is the worst case scenario. Right. If, uh, if we cannot negotiate with FDOT to kick in the extra dollars for design. Correct. Is there money in the one cent sales tax leftover funds for that? Well, we're going to have to move money around. Um, and, and depending on when we would, uh, <clears throat> well, the design is going to have to occur immediately, correct? Uh, yes. So by October 30th, the city needs to, to sign the, the LAP agreement. Uh, so between Assuming we proceeded between now and, and, and uh, October 30th, city staff would be working with uh, FDOT to, to, to make the arrangements and make that happen. We know there's money in the special use fund. We know that. Lynn? I'm adamantly opposed to using the money from the special use fund for this. Adamantly opposed. I would agree with you. There's been many projects that have come down the wire that we've talked about using that money for that got vetoed, and I, I've got to say I stand up for this one. I, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I know that um, how what the planning timeline is with um, the MPO. I mean, these things have to be on their, their list for years before they get funded. Mm -hmm. um, if we, you know, if there's local op or if there's local option sales tax dollars available, then. Kristen Simeon from Finance. So there are some undesignated funds still available in the um, current sales tax. Um, again, we had brought to you for Harbor Walk 2A and 2B at one point, which is um, now that is being broken out into two pieces. So we just don't know what's going to be needed for that project at this time, but. Um, at the moment, we do have some funds for that. I mean, if this is a priority to preserve those grant dollars, we will have to move money around mm -hmm. in the one cent sales tax. Mm -hmm. But it took a while to get these grant funds. You know, I understand, and it's a lot of money. And this was, it's been on, on the city's list of priorities um, for many years at the MPO. I know, you know, I mean, you sit on the MPO board and these things, and Mitchell also participates on all the MPO committees, um, and I'm a, I've sat on the MPO board. These things don't happen quickly. So, Gary? I have a question, and it may be irrelevant, but um, I'm not real excited about using uh, transfer and special use fund, but could we loan from that fund with a, with a future priority that the next round is 1% sales tax would repay that loan to the special use fund? I'm just asking if we're allowed to do it. We wouldn't have a guarantee that the sales tax committee is going to put it on the right. list. Yeah, there's no guarantee. I, I would like to see us figure out 
Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of the project. I'd like to, for us to, to figure out how we can come up with one set sales tax the, and others to, to fund the The other the thing delta. is um, with the interest that's being earned on the special use fund, would you be opposed to using interest from that fund? Because we've had those monies in there, so it is accumulating interest. Um, it might not cover the full amount of the project. But How much is that? Um, I don't know it offhand, but I could get that number for you. In other words, we can move money around in the sales tax to get this thing moving. Then let's because you have, we have a deadline yeah. to, to meet. And if we don't meet that deadline, then possibly we don't get the over $3 million in grant funding. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, there you go. Yeah. Question, how, if we were to uh, uh, table this issue for a few minutes, would you be able to get those numbers for us that we've been requesting? Yep, I can go. Well. Could I suggest that we table this discussion for a few minutes and well, we allow could, we could us move to get on some to numbers? the discussion on the the next item on the agenda as the perform department performance objectives. We could do that and come back to this if you would like. I think that would be prudent because then we would be able to have some real numbers to work with okay. to see you know if we're it's way out of the ballpark okay or with if everyone? we're getting close. It's fine with me. Okay, then let's do that. Let's move forward on the department uh, performance objectives and. Um, that's under rec it's on recommendation of city officers so Howard I'll turn this over to you well each year we provide you with uh, performance objectives um, under this council manager form of government really the only objectives that you actually have to uh, approve if you want to are the city clerk and city manager um, uh, the, all the other departments will provide you so you can get a glimpse of how uh, the city manager will be evaluating some of the other departments and divisions. This is what uh, I use to, to evaluate their performance. Um, and so we, we include dates in there when we can. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a tool that we use and then based on uh, our annual evaluation determines, uh, uh, you know, how well we do. Um, so at least in the first page, you have the uh, objectives for the city clerk and the city manager. Um, and then you have the rest of the divisions and departments as you go along. Mm -hmm. Comments? Lynn? Um, I have a couple of things. Um, in the future, I would like to see this be a little bit more specific. Um, I think some of these goals and objectives are fairly vague. Um, I like as an example um, something that was brought up at my my kitchen cabinet group meeting um, like to say something along the lines of the city manager would hold um, a couple of town hall meetings every year and maybe specify that there would be two or three town hall meetings during the course of a given year um, that's one thing I also think we should really put some serious emphasis on annexation I think we're pretty laid back about what's going on with annexation. And I think if that's gonna be a goal of our future growth in the city, I think we need to put some special emphasis on it. And that might mean that we come up with a special category for properties along, especially along the 41 corridor and the Jones Loop corridor. We create a special category for some properties that have given us a, a no-go um, in the past. And maybe we say we have a special category that will allow them to be grandfathered that the, the big thing for a lot of them is signage for as, as an example. And I think perhaps if we go back to them and we create a special category, find out how many of those properties would then be willing to annex in the city. I think we're going to find a tremendous higher increase in um, activity with those particular properties that have been so negative about annexation in the past. I do think that's something we really have to focus on. We also passed um, a, a, a general rule a couple of years ago, right after I got elected, that if a property came online with our water and sewer service, that we would make them sign a letter of intent to annex. We've never enforced that. I think we should go back and try to work with communities such as Waterford and Creekside and places like that that are on our water and sewer service and encourage them to annex in. And again, maybe we have to look at the the rules we, we're using for annexation right now, but I think that those types of things could really help us get the annexation program 
um, kick-started, and I really think we need to focus on that next year. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree with you on the annexation piece. I've talked about with Howard about that before. Uh, <clears throat> my feeling is these are properties, they may be technically in the county, but they're here. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that we're better off having them be a part of our community than not. And even if a, a whole community, such as um, Charlotte Harbor, um, you know, it's better to have some consistency and have them want to be a part of something as opposed to they're here. And there are people that come here to this community, they don't realize that these are not in Punta Gorda. They think they're all part of Punta Gorda. So they reflect on us whether we like it or not. So uh, the other thing, um, I was looking over these ob objectives and I feel I agree with you on that needing smart objectives and I see I feel like every year I say this and making these specific measurable time bound you know timely um, and <clears throat> realistic and I went through these and I have to be really honest with you Howard I felt like most of these were a job description there are 101 bullets out of all 101 bullets I found six that I found were actually I might consider to be a smart objective and 33 of them have the possibility of being, and the rest of them were just, if I show up, this is what I'm supposed to do. So it's like, that's not an objective. Showing up is not, and, and just, you know, my job, my job description is not an objective. It's what are we trying to do to better our community? And that, to me, is an objective. So uh, it's my, you know, um, coaching. <laughs> on objectives and um, my comment. Gary? <clears throat> I want to state that I am all for the idea of annexing. Mm -hmm. However, I think we need to be somewhat cautious about trying to force certain types of annexation without having the uh, infrastructural resources. Mm -hmm. And also keep in mind the revenue that that annexation will give us. I think that uh, we're at a juncture with, with some of the other issues that we're dealing with uh, to actively and proactively pursue a annexation that will cost us more to support than the revenue it'll generate the city. We need to take a breath before we go down that route uh, as far as if we're being proactive. If they want to come to us, I think we do have, we have a moral obligation and a, and a proper obligation to accept that, but to go after uh, proactively over all those areas because they're interspersed with us, we, we need to also ask our question, and you hear this from me, you know, the, the ROI question, what is the return? Does it return us at least sufficient revenue and or does it improve our quality of life? Those are the two um, main uh, currencies I think we need to deal in when we make these types of movements. So I think we have to be a little cautious uh, uh, before we were to actively try to approach somebody to say, you know, to put a little pressure on them to annex them in, mm -hmm. we need to ask ourselves those questions first, I think, as a, mm -hmm. as a council and as a city. We've actually, a had, we've actually had requests from people before and actually turned them down because of what you just suggested. Yeah, that's my point. Yep. Uh, I think, though, to, to the point of we keep putting annexation on here, if we're going to put annexation on, as an objective, then let's put some teeth behind it and, mm -hmm. and what are we going to do to make that happen, so. Uh, uh, well, if, if you want to deal with US 41, there is a easy solution, but I'm not know if we want to go down that track because we've heard from some of the businesses along 41 that they do not want to annex in mm -hmm. because of signage. And the signage they have does not meet our code. If there's a storm event and those signs are damaged more than 50% and they were in the city, they would have to then redo the signage to our code. Mm -hmm. Now, for many years, city council has requested the Charlotte County Commission do an overlay district to mm -hmm. adopt our sign codes because we hold all the other folks within the city of Punta Gorda to a sign standard. If we want to annex in some of these other properties, they would come in if we relax that sign code. Do we want to go that route? 
Mm. I asked the question because we could amend our land development regulations, relax the sign code, and approach these folks, let them know, and see if they're really serious. Is that, do we want to go that route? I pose the question. I think we could create a special overlay district of our own within, that falls within our city boundaries um, that would give us some flexibility with just those properties that we're talking about it would be south of the Kia Sta, um, on the 41 corridor and on the Jones Loop corridor. I think that specifically are the are two areas that I think we really could do a lot with annexation if we were to put our efforts forth. And I understand what you're saying, Gary. I, I, I get that. But um, at some point, we, we've got to get those properties incorporated into the city at some point. Because, I mean, it's right now we just have really big, huge um, – you got a comment. So we we really have a lot of enclaves right now that we could we could get rid of. Okay. To your point, and also to Howard's point, in the overall scheme of things, I don't want to go down that route because of a perpetuality issue. If there was a way to craft it where we would give them a a guarantee that they could maintain their si si signage even after damage of a storm for I'm just a number. This is not like 84 feet. It is like 84 feet. It's just a number. <laughs> 10 years. But if there's no storm, if there's a storm within the 10 years, the damage is their sign, they can put their sign back up and keep it like that way. But that grandfathering clause ends at some, some juncture, whether it's 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Because at some point, you don't want, I don't think you don't want to, uh, th there's a Yiddish word, un ungapach. I think it's, that makes it, you don't. You want to have our standardization within our city limits as people come into our community, particularly as we're going to go down the road with with a master plan and trying to uh, to craft and maintain the sustainability of our city in the future. Um, there comes a time that you have to to say, okay, sorry, you know, you need to do this. So maybe we could work out a a uh, a formula that would allow them to maintain their signage for a, a period of time on a guarantee basis. But in at such time, when their signage becomes damaged, then they would have to comply with the rest of the community. Uh, there could be some other creative options that could be explored. I know one of the things that um, I've seen urban design staff recommend to a particular property owner was the use of a creative sign ordinance. And so there might be some possibilities of, of instead of a big billboard sign, coming up with some really clever creative sign that would, you know, could be used where they could do something, some advertising could be on it maybe, but it's clever, it's cute, it's going to be much more of an attraction, you know, um, so there might be some options that could be explored, so, um, but I would, uh, you raise a good point, Howard. It's, yeah, I, I uh, you know, with Charlotte Park, mm -hmm. um, Charlotte Park is going to cost us dollars mm -hmm. if we annex them in. Between police, not fire so much, but police and code, code compliance, um, it, if we hold them to a standard, such as the surrounding neighborhoods around them, and we know who those surrounding neighborhoods are, that's PGI and Burnstar Isles, if we hold them to a standard somewhat similar to those neighborhoods, uh, it's going to take an effort. It's going to take an effort mm -hmm. to do that. If we annex them in and do not hold them to that standard, then what's the purpose of bringing them in? But it's I've, going to cost us dollars to do it. And I've maintained in previous discussions that, that yes, we have a special residential overlay, but we have an historic district and we have neighborhood residential, and those are all different. So it might not, it, having a, uh, using Charlotte Park as an example, another neighborhood that has its own set of codes that's a little more standardized than, than what they may currently have. Um, it's better than perhaps what it is today, and people think that it's us. Now, I understand what you're saying. It may cost us money, and so we have to look at that ROI, as Gary suggests. Mm -hmm. We can come up with an overlay district for Charlotte Park, but if we don't want to at least improve through our codes, the appearance 
of some of the areas in Charlotte Park, what are we gaining from it? That, that's my mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to at least, yeah, it doesn't have to be like held up to like a PGI or BSI. I understand that. We can come up with something, you know. But the, that the prior problem there in that specific neighborhood was the, the concern that they would be forced to convert from septic to sewer. Well, uh, yeah, that has nothing that, to do with it. Yeah. So that has nothing to do, I mean, That's a county going issue. forward, what? That's a county issue. We want to do it, but the county is the one that has to, to agree to let that happen. Well, that's going to end up being solved over time. So. Right. Um, well, one other aspect that we talk about, um, annexation of additional residential areas, is that we, we do have to have enough commercial that they can consume. Otherwise, there actually is no benefit because it just costs the city money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and my, my recommendation is that we focus more on the commercial aspect of it than we do residential at this point in time. I think that's really where I think we should put some emphasis and, mm -hmm. and really dig our teeth in a little bit about it for the next few years. Because I think, I think that's going to be very critical to our future development as we go and expand our, bo our borders south and east of the city right now. Well, so. we're going to have an opportunity. Um, if you proceed to hire a firm to redo the land development regulations and the comp plan amendments, we can incorporate in there, take a specific look at some signage along 41 and Jones Loop Road. Mm -hmm. It's going to all be a part of this yep. and see what you come up with. Well, and staff has already come up with a high uh, interstate, com is it interstate yes. commercial yes. code that we've put on hold yes. for the citywide master plan. And I know that there are some uh, businesses along commercial properties along Jones Loop Road that are waiting for that mm -hmm. to get done so that they can annex so they know what is it they're adding into. Right now it's this unknown. Yeah. So um, we have some people that are waiting. Yep. Other discussion on this? To be honest with you, I know we have not been successful mm -hmm. in really accomplishing annexation in a, in a manner we want to. We and haven't. And I some just understand. don't want to. They yeah, just some don't, don't want to. They don't. I know. We have to make them want to yeah. somehow. I'd yeah. like to make a point, too, because there, there was a comment made by, for example, the, within our service area, there are areas, um, Tom's not here right now, but as, as that service area develops, there's areas that we would certainly at some t time in the future would like to annex, and they're industrial areas. And there are areas that would give us these commercial taxes and all these types of things that we hope to see, but we don't have a way to touch them yet. Cheney Brothers being a good example. Uh, and we have an incentive if, when we get to that point for those <coughs> industrial properties if, as developed to want to annex into us because then they get a, they'll get a break on their water and their sewer mm -hmm. uh, uh, example. And then we can also get those tax revenues, uh, our portion of those tax revenues, and I suspect that they won't increase our costs at the same way that, that certain residential neighborhoods would. So that may be the, the focus with a master plan. We may be able to also work with the county or with, through the county so, some way to get to that point where we can expand out to those areas. But mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's going to be quite a ways, unfortunately, I think, mm -hmm. down the road. So what would you like for us to do with this list of objectives? Uh, Yes, if you want, you can just at least approve the city clerk and city manager's objectives so that you have something to evaluate us on. <laughs> I move that we approve the city clerk and city manager's objectives. Second. There's been a motion to approve the city clerk and the city manager's objectives. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Did you say aye, Debbie? Yes. I oh, okay. Second. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, back to the item that we had before. Yes, so looking at prior year and our fiscal year 20 interest um, calculation for, um, or pro projection for um, the special use fund, we'd have about $175,000 that could be used without touching the principal from the fish bill. Wow. That would be fine. That would be good. That would, that would and then the rest would have to come from uh, that would lower the 1% sales from, tax. It makes it a little bit more palatable, doesn't yes, it? it? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> and then use the rest from the 1%. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. So I would okay. Agree to that. So does somebody want to make a motion? I'll make I, a motion. I, I, oh, was go just, ahead. This was my idea. <laughs> Disregard my statement. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay. I gave you the other one. <laughs> okay. I, I move that we go forward with the. Uh, uh, how, how should I say it? I oh, know. see. Yeah. Now, now you got me tongue. I had what I said, and I. There we go. Uh, the uh, uh, airport to Carmelita improvement project and FDOT lap funding. You're welcome. Thank you. Second. <laughs> <laughs> we need to specify how we're funding it. And we're, we're going to appropriate $175,000 from the special use fund interest earnings. Uh -huh. And the remainder comes from the 1% sales tax. Right. Yes. In case we need to, uh, unless FDOT steps up to the plate. And <laughs> right. Thank you for getting that information. That makes a big difference. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Uh, on this, as was stated, I'll make it simple. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, accommodating me, getting those numbers so quickly. Appreciate it. Okay. So we'll continue with recommendation from city officer, city attorney. Um, I have nothing. How would we? What about me? Oh, you have more? Well, you haven't gotten to me yet. I did. Oh, I do have more, yes. Oh. Sorry. We were already on you, but okay, good. Then let's go. I do have one item. Um, and I sent you an email last night regarding this item. So something has come to our attention that, uh, frankly, as far as staff is concerned, we're kind of scratching our head. And it happens. These things happen. Unintended consequences. When we approved the uh, plan development rezoning for 900 West Marion, the former Impact <coughs> University site, building two, I'm gonna state exactly what it says. Building two uh, will house the Military Heritage Museum, it's currently there, open to the public, office space, and an auditorium which will be accessory to the hotel units on the property and the timeshare units at Fisherman's Village. The auditorium will not be open to the outside public. That was all part of the agreement as part of the plan development um, that was written into there by the uh, applicants. The applicants this was their proposal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we approved it. Um, but we have a, a problem, mm -hmm. and the problem is that the Military Heritage Museum is using the auditorium, plans to use the auditorium for events. These events, in our mind as staff, add value to the community, add value to the Military Heritage Museum, is a is a perfect use for the auditorium. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand. Right. But we have this language that was approved. So um, we've come up with an idea on how to deal with this. If you agree with us, if you don't agree with us, okay, but we have an idea on how to deal with this. We have set up a meeting for Friday with uh, Patty Allen, general manager of Fisherman's Village. Assuming the discussion goes the way we hope it will go today. And in addition, our city attorney has an idea on how to deal with the events that the Military Heritage Museum has planned for the auditorium in the interim, depending on how you feel about it. So in order to um, effectuate what appears to be the uh, intended use of the auditorium, uh, it will be necessary to amend the ordinance uh, Exhibit B, uh, which provides um, uh, the restrictive language that how, we're just, how we just read. That's not a big deal, assuming that um, you know, we have to go through the process of doing that and the city council approves that. Um, in Fisherman Village. And, well, yeah, I mean, they're the, they're the ones that are going to have to 
actually ask us to amend the ordinance because they're the ones that asked for this language to begin with. And in the interim, um, because uh, like any other zoning ordinance, um, it would be up to the city to, to enforce the, the deviations from the ordinance, um, the city council can, and we've done this in the past, uh, make a determination to waive enforcement of that particular provision that it not be uh, open to the outside public um, until such time as uh, it, you know, it's either an ordinance is adopted or uh, an ordinance is um, uh, rejected with respect to the amendment. And we're not talking a long period of time. I mean, we would, I mean, we're planning to have a meeting as early as Friday. So it would need to go through the, the standard procedure of notice, planning commission, and then come back for, you know, for two readings before us. Mm -hmm. So it, yes, it doesn't need to be a, a, a protracted period of time. So okay. just to be clear, um, they would be permitted to continue having the events that are scheduled on their calendar until well, we get this resolved? To be clear, they wouldn't be permitted to do it, but we wouldn't be seeking, we wouldn't be enforcing the violation of the ordinance. So they can go ahead, they can do it without, without, without fear of enforcement. The only way they would be permitted to do it is by amending the ordinance. That's the legal position. We've done this before yeah. when we, when there's consensus among council, again, council has to have a discussion about this. Mm -hmm. We've done it before. We said, look, we're heading in a particular direction based on consensus of city council, hold off code enforcement until we can deal with this one way or another. And, f you know, in, in the nature of full disclosure, um, you know, I was, I was looking at the, uh, the minutes of, uh, of the city council meeting. Um, I think there was concern regarding parking associated with the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, 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 in, in my, I won't say my recollection at, at all, but my assumption from reading the minutes was that in order to uh, avoid uh, objections from those who might object to parking, uh, there was um, a, a, a commitment in the words of the applicant that the auditorium would not be open to the outside public. So it is conceivable, again, in way of full disclosure, that um, the parking issue may arise again, and you may ultimately determine when the ordinance comes before you um, to, to continue the restriction regarding um, the, outs the use of the outside public. But, but in order to rectify the situation, if everyone is in agreement, including the city council, following a public hearing, the ordinance can be amended to allow for those activities. Then, um, full disclosure, I am a member of the board of directors of the museum, um, and I, I I can tell you that Fisherman's Village has been in negotiations with, not negotiations, in discussions with the executive director of the museum. Um, it is the intent, and it's also in the lease for the museum, that there is a parking lot is pro being proposed for the front corner of the, uh, in front of the building, <coughs> where the guard house is. They're, they've talked about removing the guard building and putting parking area there. They've also made special accommodations for parking uh, under the other building, on the grass area behind, and also people are also using West Retta where it's kind of a non-used street area back there for the time being. And they've also even discussed possibly putting gravel down in the interim so that the uh, um, auditorium can be accommodated. So um, this is the livelihood of the museum and in order for them to pay the rent, they have to be able to have these kinds of events. So mm -hmm. I would really hope that we can do something to at least give them some time to work this out with Fisherman's Village. And I get nothing for that, by the way. I'm not paid. I, mean, I, I think we have to um, accommodate them. This is, um, you know, this is supposed to be one of our, our gems of our history district. And I know just looking at the things I've been invited to in the next three weeks at the History Museum that this is a really busy time for them. Yeah. I don't, we have to accommodate them in my, my opinion. Gary? Okay, I'm ditto to everything that's just been said. It seems to me mm -hmm. I'm reading that there's a consensus among us. Um, 
I, from my perspective, I view this museum the same way I view the uh, Visual Arts Center and the, and the Peace River Wildlife Center mm -hmm. as a public asset. Uh, Fisherman's Village has certainly gone uh, bent over backwards to, uh, to be accommodating, to, to allow this to happen in such a wonderful way. And uh, so I would, uh, with, I, I don't think I need to do have a lot of encouragement that everybody have consensus to uh, 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 have a resolution so that this can get sorted out appropriately. Yeah, I think I see Jaw has said, oh, absolutely. Kind of, yeah. I, it, they have, the Military Heritage Museum has brought <laughs> life to that property yeah. and has just been, so, has done such amazing things. It's been a, a, a great asset. So what do we no, do? Our no, resolution no. then is to code compliance to just no no we don't it? we don't need a resolution. Oh okay. When we find these things out, our job is to come to you with the issue and a way to resolve it. Mm -hmm. We've come to you with the issue. We've come to you with how we plan to resolve it. So all I need from you is is there a consensus upon city council? I think that's pretty that obvious. we kind of hold off code compliance for a while until we get this thing fir firmly resolved. I think I'm seeing yes. Yeah. 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 Now, just to be Not clear, the be clear. code <laughs> compliance would be with respect to the use of the auditorium. Yes. Right. But any structural changes or changes to the driveway or anything like that, right. they're, they're going to need to come back and get Absolutely. approval in more sure. formal fashion. Yeah. Absolutely. Understood. Yep. Okay. We've got, we've got okay. direction. Yep. Good. Thank you very much. I will share the information yeah. with Gary Butler. Mm -hmm. okay. You're welcome. All I got. I have nothing for it. Nothing. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> City Clerk. Yes, just a few things under boards and committees, starting with vacancies. We have an unexpired term as an alternate on the Code Enforcement Board, a three year term on the Punagorda Isles Advisory Committee, an unexpired term on the Police Officers Pension Board, an unexpired term as an alternate on the Board of Zoning Appeals, three three year terms on the Historic Preservation Advisory Board, and an unexpired term on the Utility Advisory Board. Under nominations, uh, we have an unexpired term on the Utility Advisory Board, and we have two eligible applicants. So typically what we would do is we would nominate the individuals for this seat. However, um, we have been announcing um, another vacancy on the board for some time without distinguishing what seat it was. Um, so, since we have two applicants, I would like you to consider uh, nominating and possibly appointing both the individuals because this board has been uh, without a full um, quorum for some time, but it, it's up to you. That's just my recommendation. I move that we nominate and appoint. Second. There's been a nomination and a second to appoint both individuals to the vacant seats on the Utility Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, also then under nominations, we have three three-year terms on the Burnt Store Isles Canal Advisory Committee. We have eight eligible applicants for nomination. Well, we have one that where we have an appointment that you were, you've already mm -hmm. advertised it, and then you have the other three that are at Whoever is appointed to the other seat um, will be taken off this list. So these individuals applied after. Oh, you're other, talking about just so the ones for these seats that are, gotcha. So do we nominate all of them? <coughs> no, just nominate, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, all nominate right. all of them. Okay, and the last item under nominations is a two-year term on the Firefighters Pension Board. Uh, we do have one eligible applicant, Mr. Albers. If you would like to nominate and appoint at this time, I need a motion. I move that we nominate and appoint. Second. There's been a, a nomination and a second for Mr. Albers for the uh, Firefighters Pension Board. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And then the last thing is actually an appointment for the Burnt Store Isles Canal Advisory Committee. Your voting forms are coming around. Um, we have three eligible applicants for one seat. So you're voting for one, please.
Um, we have a tie between uh, Mr. Bowdish and Sean Howard. I just happen to have tie break forms. <laughs> Um, doesn't have the members or the applicants' names. It just has BSI. So if you would please just write the name of the individual on the form. And the appointee is Mr. Bowdish. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. <clears throat> Under policy and legislation, um, we did present to the legislative delegation, and um, we did it. So thank you for being there <laughs> and for supporting the, the effort that day. I know, Howard, you were uh, otherwise engage in another um, yes so um, I got a request uh, from an individual uh, wanting to know um, I've been, I'm back in town and I don't see the signage on I-75 for the Military Heritage Museum and the Vietnam Wall and so what's up so I emailed um, our contact Zach Birch uh, who's for the District 1, what's the status of this? I get a reply from this individual. Uh, well, we need to know the number of visitations that you're expecting at the Vietnam Wall and the Military Heritage Museum. I'm saying, we've been through this drill before. And so I emailed Howard and said, uh, and we talked on the phone, it's kind of like, I, this should be resolved because it's like Representative Grant's office worked on this and we even had, I think the governor even said something like, this is a done deal. Yeah. We and had, We had drafts of the signs, what, what they were going to look like yeah, and everything. Yeah, everything. And so now they're coming back and saying, well, and I even got an email today. Like, well, who are you, who, did, who talked to you? So Representative Grant's office is not real happy. <laughs> They're on it. They're on it. So we have to be continued as to follow up and say, well, what, what's happened here? Because it obviously didn't get implemented to the way we thought it was going to get taken care of. So we had last night, at the end of the day, we had this and the Military Heritage Museum events going on at the same time. That's how the day ended. You don't have it resolved yet? No. <laughs> Yeah, so it was uh, like a shock to us this week. I have the email in my archive somewhere that was oh, yeah. the actual approval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was approved. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was approved. So as as um, <laughs> as Howard said to me, that Representative Grant's assistant is she's all, on it, she's on it okay. all over it. So yeah. we are following up on this one for sure. Um, because that was a shock to us. Um, and um, Halloween is coming up, and city staff has requested anyone who would like to pr donate candy to the cause. Um, we have uh, donation boxes, and we put, put that in our the weekly report in our newsletters, so I want to encourage anyone that wants to help the kids. I know I've, my husband's been going to the store and buying buy one, get one free <laughs> bags of candy, so I've just got to bring it 
Did you eat all those Hershey bars already? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you should see in the chaos office. It's got like cases and cases of Hershey bars that Walmart donated. 9,000. Oh, 1,000? 9,000 pieces of Hershey bars. <laughs> Holy cow. Did you see those big cases? Oh, my Lord. I couldn't believe it. No. I looked at it. I was like, whoa. Gee, I, I don't know how I missed that. I guess I need to go up there and visit more often. <laughs> On Monday, there were 10,000. <laughs> you're gonna have chocolate dripping down this <laughs> Now that we've said that, you're gonna have every every resident in this community is going to want an appointment with you, Howard. <laughs> it's gonna have, they're gonna take as many bars as they want. <laughs> well, maybe we don't need to get resident <laughs> candy from the residents. So, okay. Um, so, council member comments. Well, I'll just, uh, one quick comment is, is I guess it's a good thing that we have natural occurring um, uh, fluoride in our water so that we can protect our teeth from the cavities. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I have nothing. <laughs> I just want to say for the record, I got an email last weekend um, that someone thought that we had stopped production on Buckley's Pass. And there was a mass hysteria going on over that. And if somebody posted it on Nextdoor. I can promise you that they are still working on Buckley's Pass, a very active construction site. So it is still happening. <laughs> there, and the equipment is still on site. So I don't know where the rumor started, but it was not correct. They may look at some of these photos. They may see, like, they don't notice a lot of <laughs> difference between one week and the other. But guaranteed work is still going on. and. I actually had somebody go out in their dinghy to take pictures for me because they were they were very upset. So <laughs> it's, it's it's absolutely happening. It's still under construction. Everything's a go. Good so. news is it's a popular project for those who are watching on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Jaha. Nothing. I think yeah I, yeah. I, I, Gary said everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Citizens' comments on any agenda item or not? Excuse me. Anything you want to talk about? Three minutes. Hi, Sheila Yeager, and once again, I'm going to both thank you for the opportunity and apologize in advance. Uh, these are social media comments from June 2019. The noise is not welcome anywhere. Ask Burnt Store Marina, Phoenix, etc. If the pickleball players are so keen on playing, it should not matter where they play. That's from a BSI resident. The leader should admit it was a mistake to put it there. We have plenty of room in the sports complex that contains fields, et cetera, and plenty of parking and no houses in the vicinity. That's from a bird section resident. Why would anyone want to gather in front of other people's homes and create a disturbance? I don't care if it's a park, plain and simple, it's rude. That's from somebody that lives on Virginia Avenue here in the historic <laughs> district. These comments tell one side of the story. On the other side, the argument that seems to have the most legs is that it's a park. Yes, Gilcrest is a park, but Punta Gorda supports the principle that park activities have limits. For five years, we've been trying to get the council to respect that. City of Punta Gorda Chapter 16 Park Regulations. Preventing disturbances of the use and enjoyment of city parks by others and disturbances of the peaceful and quiet use, peaceful and quiet use and enjoyment of nearby residential uses by their occupants. It's divisive, it's controversial. The controversy won't simply vanish because you wish it to, nor will the underlying problem. Some claims have been made that the temporary solution we now have is a reasonable compromise. Not so. If something is inappropriate, it's inappropriate. If your neighbor's eight children trample your flowers and you protest, it's not a compromise to have four or even one of them stomping around. Your flowers are dead either way. While congestion and parking are better with fewer pickleball players, the pops are as loud and as attention grabbing, just fewer per second. When pickleball play starts, whether by four players, 16 players, or 32, peaceful and quiet use of our homes is still disturbed. Peaceful and quiet use by any reasonable definition dictionary, commonsensical, or legal, if there is a legal definition of peaceful and quiet. 
Cities across the country have confronted and dealt with this issue. We aren't asking you for the solution cities like Boulder and Suntan City used to build the pickleball courts eight feet down in a pit. We are asking you to recognize, as the eight foot down solution unquestionably suggests, that pickleball play is inappropriate in a residential context. As you move forward with planning for the park and city, please recognize this. Please convert the pickleball courts in Gilchrist back to something with proven neighborhood compatibility like tennis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? Gary, I'm surprised you didn't come up. Well, second call. Oh, uh, I already, I, it's late. <laughs> Meeting late. adjourned. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't.